into this mic. Is that good enough? Yep, you'll be good right there. Okay, great. So folks, uh, we're going to start in just a moment with a few introductory remarks. If you want to grab a pastry or a coffee or something real quick, um, please do, and then we'll, we'll get going. So we are a little pressed for time this morning. Okay. Well, while folks do that, I'm going to go ahead and just do the introductory remarks. Um, first, I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, today's lecture series on key issues in design, conduct, and analysis of clinical research trials. Um, I'd like to welcome both the people we have here in the room at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center in Seattle, Washington, USA, as well as our international audience that is joining us uh, by web streaming. Um, I should note that the recording of today's lecture series will be available at the uh, same address that people are using to web stream today, and we will post a link to that streaming on the hptn.org webpage uh, after today, so anybody can access this in the future going forward if they miss uh, all or part of it today. Um, yeah, I'm Sam Griffith, uh, Senior Clinical Research Manager at FHI 360, along with my colleague Erica Hamilton. We are the managers for the HPTN Scholars Program, which is a fellowship, a mentored fellowship for early career uh, investigators in HIV science. The, the young folks who are going to form the next generation of HIV researchers, we hope, within the uh, NIH and within the United States Research Enterprise. Um, we have here today three of our four current HPTN scholars. Uh, we have Tierney Richwood, Nicole Salazar Austin, and Laramie Smith. Uh, our fourth scholar couldn't be with us today, uh, but her name is Sola uh, Ojukutu. Um, I should mention that we are now in the solicitation phase for the next crop of uh, HPTN scholars. Uh, and if you're interested in applying, the deadline is coming, so please go as soon as you can to hptn.org slash scholars, or just hptn.org, um, and then you know, search around, you'll find it. Uh, and you'll find the application materials and more information about the program there. Um, today's logistics. So uh, we have here the schedule for today's talk. Um, it is four hours, well, four hours, 35 minutes. We are going to maybe be a little flexible because we have this room till one o'clock, so we may run over just a little bit, but it's basically four one-hour segments. Um, Dr. Fleming will be happy to take a few questions during the lectures because that obviously makes it more interactive, but he has compressed, uh, he's been kind enough to compress 90 minutes worth of uh, instruction into 60 minutes four times. So uh, overall, he's a statistician, he pointed out 5% less material, but 33% less time. We did a standard deviation, which I can't remember. Um, and uh, so we're going to have to move a little bit quickly. Um, we do want to uh, also include our virtual participants. So um, if you're uh, joining us virtually, please tweet questions you might have to at HIVPTN or post to our at HIVPTN Facebook page. Um, and a colleague will forward uh, a synopsis of those questions to us. And as we're able, we'll work those questions into Dr. Fleming's you know, remarks and responses uh, as we go. Um, yeah, I just do want, well, before we get started, I just do want to mention that today's events are collaboration between the HIV Prevention Trials Network Scholars Program, which I've just been talking about, and the HIV Vaccine uh, Trials Program, or HVTN both of which are funded by the Division of AIDS within the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, which is part of the National Institutes of Health of the United States. Um, the scholars program is all, also funded by, uh, in part by the National Institute for Mental Health. Um, I'd like to also thank Alex Berger and Jenna Gordon, our colleagues here at HVTN, who have been super critical in getting us the space and helping with all logistics and setting up this event in, in its entirety, so thank you. Um, without further ado, let me introduce today's speaker. Uh, we're very lucky today to have our distinguished lecturer, uh, Dr. Thomas Fleming, present, professor and former chair of the Department of Biostatistics here at the University of Washington in Seattle. He's a member of the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center and the former director of the Statistical Center for the HIV, I'm uh, sorry, HPTN Trials Network. Dr. Fleming received his BA from the University of St. Thomas and his MA and PhD from the University of Maryland at College Park. Uh, Dr. Fleming has authored or co-authored several books and more than 250 research articles in peer-reviewed journals, 
notably for our hearts, uh, and recently the primary paper for uh, HPTN 052, uh, the groundbreaking 2011 study uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. He's chaired or served on data monitoring committees for more than 100 clinical trials and has served for more than 25 years as a regular member of FDA advisory committees and is an invited voting member there on more than 100 occasions. Dr. Fleming is a recipient of the Outstanding Teaching Award for School of Public Health from here at the University of Washington and the FDA Commissioner's Special Citation Award for Extraordinary Contribution to the Agency. He is the 2007 Greenberg Lecture at the University of North Carolina, the 2009 Distinguished Lecture at the School of Public Health at the University of Washington, and in 2011, the Ross Prentice Endowed Professor of Biostatistical Collaboration. And finally, besides capping his career by speaking to us, he was inducted as a member of the Institute of Medicine at the National Academies in 2012. Dr. Fleming, thank you so much. Thank you, Sam, uh, and to Erica as well for putting all of this together. And in advance to all of you, uh, it's a privilege for me to be here. What research is being done by HPTN and others for prevention of the spread of HIV, and more broadly, what is being done in medical research to enhance treatment and prevention of diseases is extraordinarily important. Some of us have been privileged to have been part of this and yet we realize the challenges will well go beyond our time period and you're our future. And uh, it's, we, we are so pleased to have you with your commitments to enhancing healthcare. Uh, and as a step in that direction, I'm, I'm delighted to be here today to share some of the insights. Um, as Sam said, there's a lot to talk about. Um, I really enjoy the interaction, so I'm going to have attention here internally because I want to hear what you're thinking, and, I, and please do interrupt me if you have comments and questions. A lot of things that we're saying are complex or controversial, and I'll try to pace it. Um, I think Sam said we have to be out of here by 5 o'clock, right? Uh, one o'clock. Oh, 1 o'clock, okay. <laughs> I keep pushing here. So uh, there are really key issues we're going to talk. We're going to allocate about an hour to each. Uh, I'm delighted those of you are here have shown up on time because I think the most important topic is the first one. So kudos to you for being here. Um, we will talk later today though about other really key issues too. The role of biomarkers, the importance of avoiding missing data, how to address treatment effect when you're not comparing to a placebo or superiority in a non-inferiority setting. But the first topic that we're going to talk about is something that to my way of thinking is ubiquitous and has a huge influence on interpretation of clinical research. Um, it's the essence of saying, if you do a clinical trial, let's say we're looking at a vaccine to try to enhance prevention, and we pre-specify that our analysis is going to be based on when we have 300 people having transmission uh, and essentially trying to reduce susceptibility. And you do the trial and you get a p-value of 0.11 where there's a trend, but it's not persuasive. Ah, but wait a minute. If I, let, let's, let's look again. Let's come back and analyze it when we have 400 events. Or let's look at other ways that this vaccine could, could influence. Maybe it's not preventing the actual infection. Maybe it's stimulating our immune system in ways that it prevents the sequelae, the progression of disease, or reduces transmission risk. Or maybe it's that it only works in certain types of people. Or maybe, in essence, I'm underpowered and I just want to see if I have a biomarker effect. Those, it's natural and appropriate to say, when we do clinical research, that we're not going to only be looking at, in essence, the pre-specified primary analysis of the primary endpoint. We're going to explore the data so that we can, in fact, get a richer sense of what we are doing and the effects that we're having. That's very logical. The problem is how do you interpret those data? And why is it that we should be cautious? So I think it's important to recognize an incredible truth here in clinical research, and that is we want positive results. We want at the end of the day to be able to say this intervention does work, and we help to establish that. And if you're at a pharmaceutical company, it's really important because the company profits are heavily dependent on whether you can convince regulatory authorities to allow you to market this particular intervention. And that's going to be important then for 
the standing of the people within the company and their promotability. But I don't want to put this all on the private sector industry. We in academia, we have the same interest in positive results. When I was involved in one of the trials I'll talk briefly about, uh, the HBTN012 trial that looked at how single dose nevirapine could reduce transmission risk mother to child, colleagues at NIH said, you realize how important this result is, but in ways that you don't realize. Yes, it's important to preventing transmission, but this result really empowered us to be much more effective in lobbying for much more funding that we could get for future research. There's a, a real keen interest at NIH for us having positive results. Journal editors like to publish results that are positive. And so those of us in academia, we like positive results too. We want our work published. That helps us with notoriety. It helps us with promotion, et cetera. Caregivers want to have more options that they can have to offer patients or participants. Every single one of those things that I mentioned are good things. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be perceived as being successful. There's nothing wrong with wanting to have more options to offer to participants. There's nothing wrong with the interest in being able to publish results. The issue, though, is when inherent goods come in conflict with other inherent goods that are even of higher importance, that's conflict of interest. And the highest inherent good here is to pursue the truth, is to be unbiased, is to enlighten the public about what are the true benefits and risks for interventions for treatment of diseases or prevention of diseases. And so, in essence, it's critically important for us to realize that while it's okay to want a positive result, it's very important to understand how that can influence the integrity of our research. And that's what we're going to talk about uh, in this first session. So an example of this, if we're designing a clinical trial to look at a microbicide to reduce the risk of HIV transmission to protect women, or if we're looking at a vaccine, or any type of prevention intervention, and we conduct a trial. What is it that makes that trial successful? What is it, in fact, that you would say defines a successful trial? Well, an awful lot of people will say a positive result. What would be, what's the more proper definition of a successful trial? Yes. A successful trial is a trial that asks an important question and gets a reliable answer to that question. And if that is, in fact, definitive evidence that this strategy didn't work, that has successfully enlightened us to move forward. And so a successful trial is, as you say, one that reliably answers the questions that it was designed to address. Just an example of how this bias that exists, this sense of wanting to have positive results, is often not even recognized by us. So, in essence, when we say we want to look at collectively all of the evidence in a trial, there are many, many ways that we can characterize whether an intervention is effective. So again, if this were an HIV AIDS prevention trial on a vaccine, where your primary analysis was at 300 events, have I reduced the fraction of people in the intervention group that have had HIV transmission versus the control? And if that result isn't particularly impressive, then let's look at other endpoints. Like I said, let's look at whether in those people who became infected, maybe you had the same fraction who became infected, but in those who became infected, the viral set point was more favorable. There was a better immune response. There was likelihood less progression. There was less transmission risk. Uh, or maybe we would do new analyses. Maybe the endpoints that we're looking at on viral set point are influenced by one person in the treatment group that had an unfavorable result or one person in the control that had a terrific result. Let's do a non-parametric test to downweight that person who did so well in the control or the person who didn't do so well in the intervention group. We, we have, as statisticians, we're clever, too. We can come up with lots of different ways to analyze your data to help us look at things in a more favorable way. Or, as I said, let's look again. Let's get another 100 events and another 100 events and keep looking until we get a positive result. By the way, statistically, I can show you that even if an intervention has no effect at all, you will, with probability one, 
certainty. You will get a positive result if you just keep looking over time. You just keep, just be persistent. Persistence pays. Okay. Or my, my favorite is looking at nuisance covariates. So, for example, if we go back to the microbicide, we know that one of the challenges we have to get effective microbicides is to get proper adherence. Okay, well then, let's look at covariates like adherence or risk behaviors to see whether or not if this microbicide didn't yield less transmission in the microbicide group than the vaginal gel group, maybe it's because we needed to focus on those people that would be adherent. Well, in fact, that's a valid subgroup if my definition of adherence is people who at baseline are identified to be more likely adherent. That's the front rows, let's say, and the back rows less adherent. Okay, well, in that case, then, it's a valid subgroup, although there's multiple testing here that I have to worry about. My worry is that the way we've made microbicides look good isn't to specifically say, we're going to identify at baseline people more adherent and see if they're benefited. We're going to look at the people who actually adhered and the people who actually adhered, ah, they didn't become infected. Well, wait a minute, there's no causality there at all. The people who actually adhered were inherently different, probably would have had less risk behaviors, and that's the reason they did better. There's no control for those people to know who are the people in the control arm that would have actually adhered. So, in essence, there is a wonderful opportunity here to get a positive result, even if your intervention has no effect at all. You're just persistent. You keep looking over time. You look at enough subgroups. And of course, in subgroups, is it biologically plausible? Well, we have wonderful clinicians, too. They can tell you why it's biologically plausible. So this is the issue, is that, yes, we should be looking more frequently. We should be, in fact, looking broadly. But we have to take into account the fact that that could lead us to have a much greater risk of having a biased conclusion. So to motivate this, I go back to an experience I had 40 years ago when I was in graduate school. My wife and I had friends that had a newborn. And so we went to visit our friends and the newborn in the hospital. And back in those days, before you guys were born, 40 years ago, the hospitals kept all of the newborns in a nursery together. And I'll never forget, I walked into that nursery and there were 22 newborns. And I remember with pink or blue blankets, there were 20 of one color and two of the other. And I thought, my goodness, I'm going to be the one who discovered that the birth rate's no longer 50-50 by gender. <laughs> so I did what any one of you would have done. I computed a p-value. <laughs> What's the probability, by chance alone, that if it's truly half female, half male, that you would have seen this disparate and, and imbalance. And the p-value was 0, 0, 0, 1. 0, 0, 0. 1 in 10,000. That's pretty compelling evidence that we're no longer having half of the newborns male and half of the newborns female. So I thought, here I was studying mathemat theoretical mathematics. I thought, my claim to fame is going to be to be part of the team that discovered that it's no longer a 50-50 split. So for 40 years, I've been seeking to try to find someone who will be the first author of the article, I'll be the second author, as we publish this result. And I'm wondering if today my search comes to an end. Will, is, is any, the first person who raises their hand, the first one gets to be the first author. Is, come on, guys. I've been 40 years at this. <laughs> Somebody must. Well, p-value of 0, 0, 0, 1, that's impressive p-value. Why, are, why don't you want to be the first author? Why is this not impressive to you? Other than the fact that it's 8 a.m. in the morning and it's hard to be impressive at 8. What, what, what is it about this that would make you skeptical about publishing it? Well, that's a great point. It's only 22 infants. That's a really small sample size. But while you're absolutely right, this is a correct p-value. I mean, because it's so extraordinarily extreme, the p-value is correct. It truly is, even with this small sample size. One in 10,000. So what should make you skeptical about this? You are, obviously. I've offered you first authorship. But. 
okay, it is. And uh, coming back, that's a, uh, it would be good to have confirmatory evidence. You're ahead of me. And you're right. I completely agree with you. What else? Any th other reason that, yes? I've seen this lecture three times. <laughs> <laughs> what else? Um, looking at the data and then formulating a hypothesis. Yes. That yes. The data generated the hypothesis. I did not walk into that hospital saying, I have uncertainties about the birth rate being 50-50 male-female. I'm going to collect prospectively some data to determine whether or not it's 50-50. I let the experience generate the hypothesis. What does a p-value mean? In essence, the p-value here means that if it really is 50-50, there's one chance in 10,000 that this would have occurred by chance alone. Well, if I give myself one chance, one shot, a one in 10,000 is really rare. But I, I thought about this, I said, wait a minute. Every day in my life, I'm seeing 10, 20, 30 things. I'll get onto a bus, and is everybody wearing blue clothes? Or when I look at the next 20 people, did they all have the same color eyes? Or, there were huge numbers of things that I could have seen on a daily basis, and I can assure you I wasn't computing 30 p-values a day. But 30 things a day over the course of a year is 10,000. And, and if I give myself 10,000 shots, then I am going to see something that appears to be 1 in 10,000, and that's going to be by chance. I always, an example I, I use, too, is let's suppose you were interviewing to try to find someone in the Secret Service to protect the president. Okay. And Sam walks up, sharpshooter as he is, he takes one shot at the target at 300 yards and he hits the bullseye, sharpshooter. Tom, <laughs> completely inept, would be up there and shooting all over the place, take 300 shots, one of them would, let's say, happen to hit. And for reasons I understand, CNN, let's say, is partial to Tom. CNN shows Sam's one shot that hit, shows the one of Tom's 300 that hit. Okay, and if that's all you see as a, as a viewer, who are you going to hire? I don't know. Well, of course, I know the truth. I'm hiring Sam. But it's the sampling context. A p-value, the fundamental conclusion here is a p-value is interpretable only if you understand the sampling context from which it was derived. Hitting the target is only interpretable if you understand how many shots it took to hit the target. And that's the problem with exploratory analyses. We do them all the time, generating p-values. In fact, does anybody know? When a p-value is less than 2 sided 05, we give it the magical blessing. What do we call it? A p-value less than 05. Anybody know what we call that? Say again. Statistically significant. It's statistically. I don't care how you got it, whether it was the primary analysis, primary endpoint, or whether it was one of 1,000 analyses. It's statistically significant. Well, in that case, with almost certainty, an ineffective therapy will have statistically significant results if you look enough. So some examples. Uh, in my 30 to 40 years, there, there have been a number of landmark studies outside of HIV AIDS. So I'm going to use experiences in HIV AIDS and other settings as well to illustrate these issues. So one of the landmark trials that I had a chance to be involved in was in colorectal cancer. Very common cancer, but wonderfully very curable. Yeah, if you have colonoscopies, if you have early diagnosis, it's curable. Now, in fact, when the surgeon removes the tissue and thinks there are clean margins, but that tissue has positive nodes, we know epidemiologically that about half of those patients will have undetected microscopic residual disease that will lead to recurrence and death within five years. So the idea was, can we give adjuvant uh, chemotherapy to eradicate that microscopic residual disease and improve survival. So that's the setting. The trial that we had done in the late 1970s, early 1980s showed that if you give chemotherapy in yellow with 5-FU levamisole or in orange with levamisole alone, you get a 30% reduction in death rate in time, in the rate of death compared to the control arm. Well, we wanted to, we knew we knew that we had to confirm that result. Even though it was on survival, where there was an unmet need and nothing worked, we were concerned, and I'll talk a little bit why we should have been concerned, that this could have still been a spurious result, even though it was two-sided 05 p-values. So before confirming it, though, we wanted to see whether this result 
in oncology today in particular, but in all disease settings, we're recognizing that one reason results aren't favorable is that treatments work in some people and not others. So was this result uniformly apparent across all groups? Well, it turned out that these data showed that the effect was only in the young people, not the old and only in the females, not the males. To show this, in the females, there was a big improvement in survival. In the males, there was no improvement in survival. So you have to do a confirmatory trial. Should we do the confirmatory trial only in females? Should we do it only in younger patients? We run into this question all the time in medical research. If we are inclusive, then we may dilute out the benefit. If we're too restrictive, we may lose generalizability. So we're in trouble either way if we don't do the right thing. Should we, in the confirmatory trial, should we only study females? What would be things you would think about to help you answer that? Well, one key issue is, is it biologically plausible with the mechanism of this inter intervention would only work in females? And so I always say, Biostatisticians are skilled. They can come up with subgroups to make things look better. And clinicians are skilled. They can explain it biologically. So what's critical isn't whether you can biologically motivate this. It's did you, in fact, biologically motivate it before you saw the data? And in essence, in this case, we didn't. So we were skeptical. So we said, we're going to include males and females in the confirmatory trial. So that was the original study. The confirmatory trial took us another seven years. This was done in the later 80s, reported out around 1990. And it showed that, in fact, 5 fu levamisole did have, still, a 30% reduction in the rate of death. So we confirmed this very nice early result. And it was the first major breakthrough in the adjuvant therapy domain in improving survival beyond surgery for patients with colon cancer. Well, interestingly, surprisingly, this study showed that age and gender are, in fact, effect modifiers. They are. Why? Because in this much larger and more confirmatory trial, all the benefit was in the males. Exactly the opposite. First study said all the benefits in the females. Second study said, no, you have benefit, but it's all in the males. And in fact, the principal analyses were consistent. The overall analysis, the first study said, when you're looking at the reduction in death rate, 5 of ulevamisole, 28% reduction in death rate, confirmed in the second trial, much larger, 33% reduction in death rate. Same basic result. But the first study said 43% reduction in death rate in females, only nine in males. So all the effects in the females. No, the second study said three times as much effect in the males. First study said all the effect is in the young. Second study says, no, the older patients actually have more benefit. So if you explore the data and you allow the data to generate hypotheses, and that's what happened, we did not walk into that trial saying, we think this mechanistically this therapy will work predominantly in females. We did not have that insight. The data suggested it. You better be careful when the data suggests things. And I tell you. <laughs> It might sound like my, my frustration with this lecture is I think it seems obvious what I'm saying. What I am saying is missed every day. I spend my life, my life, seemingly. And in fact, I used to say until about 10 years ago, if you came and I, if I had you for one hour, I would spend it on the next lecture, which is biomarkers. Well, 10 years, I couldn't say that anymore. This is. This is ubiquitous. People want positive results. They will explore the data till they find what they like. They'll report it out, and they believe it. And they're not being, they're not being uh, deceptive intentionally. They just think that if you explore it and all the benefit is in the females, it must be true. It's noise. It's noise that you're fitting. One more example. Uh, Princess Margaret Hospital was looking at trying to improve the results of rectal surgery uh, in rectal cancer patients by giving radiation in advance. So half the people got radiation preoperatively, half got control. 
the results showed no difference. They were really disappointed. Although you might say, it's a really small trial. It was a really small trial. And if I had another hour, I would talk about the fact that the mistake they made was that back in those days, they released the data, interim data, to everybody. We don't do that anymore. We've become much wiser. We keep interim data confidential to data safety monitoring boards, to data monitoring committees, because there's a huge risk for prejudgment. People see a little data, they think they know the result. People saw these results and concluded it must be that there's no effect. In fact, when they published this result, they said, we realize it should have been a much larger, we plan to have many, many fold more patients. But they said, quote, due to absence of any differences in the early years, the study died a natural death, unquote. That's what they said when they published it, because people stopped enrolling. Well, that didn't prevent them, though, even though they had only 125, from doing subgroup analyses to make it look better. So they did a subgroup analysis. They found the patients that had Duke's stage C rectal cancer. That was a subgroup of only 38 of those 120 patients. But when you looked at this group, there was a benefit with a p-value of 0.01. Now, don't trouble me with the fact that if there is no difference overall and these people benefit, then you must be harming the others, right? How can you have equality overall benefit in one subgroup without meaning it's harming the others, which is probably quite implausible, but could be true, but not likely. But basically, after getting this result, in the same paper where they said the study had died a natural death, when they reported out this result, they said, hence there can be few arguments against the universal use of preoperative radiation. That was their, that was their conclusion. This meant this data-driven exploratory analysis meant there should be universal use. Well, the clinical committee didn't know how to interpret this, so the Medical Research Council in the UK said we're going to do a confirmatory trial. It's going to be much bigger. It's going to have 800 people. We're going to randomize them to the control of no preoperative radiation against the Princess Margaret single fraction regimen. And by the way, the VA Surgical Adjuvant Group had also done a separate trial, and they got no benefit, but when they looked in the subgroup of people with abdominal perineal resections, they got a great result. So therefore, the MRC also included an arm that was multiple fraction radiation to, in fact, verify whether the VA Surgical Adjuvant Group study was favorable. Final results, no difference at all. Princess Margaret said, well, silly. We didn't see any either until we had the insight to look in the subgroup of people who had Duke C. Okay, so Princess, so the MRC looked in the subgroup, Duke C, no difference at all. So the entire difference that was seen in the post hoc data driven subgroup that they said, hence there can be few arguments against universal use, was noise. But they were right. The Princess Margaret authors were right when they said there can be few arguments against. There's only one argument against, it doesn't work. Okay, well, the issues aren't just you're going to get spurious conclusions with p-values. Your estimates, too, are not reliable. And so many of us in biostatistics love baseball. And one of the reasons we love baseball is in baseball they keep statistics on everything. If, you're, if any of you who are a baseball fan will know that any possible way how many times, and this is the first time in history that a pitcher began a game by throwing four balls, then four strikes, successively that way six times. We can tell you how often it happened. <laughs> As if I care. Okay. Well, when we keep statistics on every, we keep statistics on the first year play. What are the, what are the first year players called in baseball? The rookies. Thank you. The rookies. And of course, we always like to find the best. So at the end of the year, we honor the rookie who did the best. What do we call that person then? We, we anoint them the what? The rookie of the year. The rookie of the year. What happens to the rookie of the year in their second year? The sophomore slump. There have been books written about the sophomore slump. The sophomore slump. Psychologists say it's the burden of being the best. Financial people say, no, you overpay them, and so they get distracted. None of the above. What is it? Regression to the mean. It's, or I, I call it random high bias. So it's really important to understand this. Really important. So what's happening? You got 
what, 30 Major League Baseball teams. Each of them have about six rookies. That gives you about 200 people, 200 rookies. So of these 200 rookies, probably 10%, 20 of them really are better. The rookie of the year is probably one of those 20. Who is it going to be? The person who overachieved that year. They're better, but they also overachieved. And the next year, they regress to their average. So why am I telling you about baseball? Well, the same thing happens in medical research. So if we're doing a vaccine trial, and we say the primary analysis in our vaccine trial to prevent prevention will be, to prevent transmission, will be looking at acquisition, looking, looking, at, the par, looking at how often, let's say, in, in discordant partners, uh, the, the vaccinated person becomes infected after 300 events. Uh, and there will be a true effect of that vaccine. I don't know what it is. I will never know what it is, but I will estimate it with variability. The bigger the trial, the less the variability. And I'm going to report that result out as my pre-specified primary analysis, the primary endpoint, no matter whether it was unimpressive or impressive. I'm going to report it out in an unbiased way. Now, if I get a result that's not very impressive, I'm going to be able to do hundreds of exploratory analyses. They're relevant to many other endpoints, covariate adjustments, analyses over time. So there are hundreds of other trues also. All of them are being estimated with variability. If I'm looking across all of those to find the best result, what is best won't just be where truth is better. It's also going to be where the random variability went in the right direction. And so it doesn't mean that I can't explore the data. If I'm exploring the data to pursue the truth and I'm just as impressed by something that looks bad as good, I'm okay. But if I'm exploring the data to find something positive, and by the way, we are. Just observe us in action. That's what we do. We want to find something that's good news. That good news is going to be an overestimate of the truth. And then when you do your confirmatory trial, you're going to be disappointed because the truth isn't as good as you thought. So they got a negative result. That was the truth. They found an exploratory subgroup that looked great. Is that because the truth is in Duke C, preoperative radiation works? No. It's where the random variability was in the right direction. The confirmatory trial that gave you the truth in a much bigger sample size by pre-specified analysis said, there's really no difference. So you're, you're on target when you say you need, an, you need a confirmatory trial. If you see something in the data, that's hypothesis generating. That's not a confirmed result. By the way, you can become, also by exploratory analyses, you can get false negatives as well as the false positives. So if you, have an MI, if you have a myocardial infarction, you need to restore blood flow. You need patency in order to prevent major cardiac damage and death. Well, we have thrombolytics. We have clot busters. They are effective in restoring blood flow. And one of the first ones that we had was streptokinase <laughs> that was shown in the GISI trial to improve mortality by 20%. But Exploratory analysis said, yeah, but it, it doesn't work in everybody. It only works in certain patients, younger patients, patients treated immediately after MI, et cetera, et cetera. Well, is that true? Is that that this remarkably important intervention shouldn't be given to all people? Should it only be given to this subgroup? Well, confirmatory trials, many of them that were also looking at, at streptokinase said, no, this isn't true. Its effects are broader. Now, one of the cool things about ISIS-2, and we don't do this enough in HIV or any setting, is if you can do a trial to look at a vaccine versus not, why not, anal not, why not randomize in multiple dimensions? In other words, do a factorial design. Randomize to vaccine, yes versus no. Randomize to, to a behavioral counseling, yes versus no. And get two answers in the same trial, which we should be doing far more often. ISIS-2 did that. The ISIS-2 trial not only looked at streptokinase, yes versus no, they also looked at aspirin, yes versus no. So they have four groups. They have the streptokinase aspirin, the streptokinase alone, the aspirin alone, and neither. Four groups. Well, what they found 
was that aspirin was beneficial, but you better know your horoscope because it doesn't work in Libra, in Libra and Gemini. Okay, so conclusions are, can I explore my data? Yes, you can. Generally, it's hypothesis generating. Is there ever a case where an exploratory analysis is reliable? Yes, but really rarely. What are the things that have to hold? One is the statistical strength of that evidence must be profound. And I don't mean the p-value of 0.01 statistically significant for the subgroup found by Princess Margaret. That was bogus. I mean a p-value with so many zeros that your pen runs out of ink. Okay, an example. When natalizumab or tisabri was being studied in multiple sclerosis, it's a really potent agent. It has, we think, likely, an important beneficial effect in slowing the time for an MS patient to progressing to being EDSS6, which is walking with a cane, or EDSS7, being wheelchair bound. Unfortunately, its immune effects led to the, the occurrence of progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy which is a debilitating, often fatal, highly morbid infection. Well, maybe it was a chance event. There were three people in 3,000 on the treatment arm and no people out of 3,000 in the control, and three versus zero is a p-value of like 0.10. That, that's not zero, 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 zero. But here's a case where comparative data from observational studies is important. PML in MS patients occurs one in a million. One in a million. This was occurring at a rate of one in a thousand. That's a thousand fold increase. That doesn't happen by chance. That is, in fact, a p value with so many zeros that your pen's going to run out of ink. So it is an extraordinary, it is a data driven conclusion, but one of such extraordinary unlikelihood by chance alone that it is persuasive. Another is biological plausibility, but I've already said, while our clinical colleagues are gifted in being able to describe why a subgroup is biologically plausible, you can make anything biologically plausible. Biological plausibility should be pre-specified. So um, there was an illustration that I wanted to give just to, to, to indicate. I, I was giving this lecture once to a company and they were an international company, so they had all of their clinical research people coming in from Europe and other places for this short course. And one of the researchers in the back of the room said, I, I know what you're talking about. I'll give you an example. If you don't, in fact, tell the exact instance of the drug and all, then you can use this example. So in essence, the example was this sponsor was developing a promising intervention that they had invested a huge amount of time to develop. And they pre-specified that they thought that this intervention would work overall in all people, but in particular in the biomarker positive patients is what they pre-specified. So, so therefore, Fleming couldn't criticize them after the fact if the results weren't great overall but were really good in the biomarker positives. They pre-specified it. Problem was when the results came back, the results overall were only trending in the right direction. And when you looked at the subgroup, it was the biomarker negatives that had all the effect. So the biomarker positives were completely negative. So they lost on their pre-specified overall analysis, and they lost on their pre-specified principal subgroup analysis in the biomarker positives. Wow, that was a huge hit to them, having invested such a great amount of time in developing this intervention in a life-threatening disease setting. They weren't ready to give up. So they went out and found a knowledgeable group of KOLs, key opinion leaders, who developed a master white paper, developing the theory for, in fact, yes, why it is true. We should expect that it's the biomarker negatives that will have the benefit. And thank goodness, just before they released the white paper, the biostatistician for the trial came back, met with them very sheepishly, and said, I found an error. I got the coding backwards. It was the positives who really had the benefit. And this group said, this clinician was saying to me, we get it. You can build an argument for whatever it is that you want to say. If I want to know something's biologically plausible, if we're doing research together 
and we find that our vaccine or our microbicide is not giving us an impressive result, but we find a subgroup where the benefit really seems great, those people who at baseline are highly adherent, don't show the results to clinical colleagues and ask them to explain it. Ask them before you show them the data, if this microbicide doesn't work uniformly, can you tell me in which group we expect it to work? That's biological plausibility. It's if they, if they predicted it and you saw it, then that's persuasive. But that's why we have statistical analysis plans. Statistical analysis plan is a pre-specified document that tells how you're going to analyze the data. So it's not very helpful to get your biological insights and justifications after the fact, because you can always give them. You're skilled. I want them before you see the data, because that's what truly then makes that result persuasive. Coming back to Sam was right. That result in the 1 in 10,000 in the maternity ward should not be persuasive because it was driven by the data. If you had predicted it, then it would have mattered. Confirmation by external results is key. So we confirmed this. Wait a minute, though. I didn't tell you the whole story. I didn't point out the whole story. This trial done in the late 70s, early 80s, this trial done in the late 80s, early 90s, did confirm that 5 of ulivamisole in yellow provides a 30% reduction in death rate. But it didn't confirm that the orange group, levamisole, provided a 30%. The confirmatory trial said, no, levamisole does nothing. How could that be? This was, these were both two-sided O5 p-values on the pre-specified primary analysis. So isn't that persuasive evidence? Look, you've got huge numbers of people with colon cancer that are dying. There's a huge unmet need, and you're telling me we can prevent death in 30% of them with a p-value of 05. Isn't that persuasive? Well, what does a two-sided 05 p-value mean? And to be a little more careful about this, it's really not a two-sided, it's a two-sided 05 p-value for benefit, not two-sided 05 benefit, two-sided 05 p-value for harm. I say to my FDA colleagues, you guys are really astute. If a sponsor brings in an intervention, it's a two-sided p-value for harm, you don't approve. You approve for a two-sided 05 p-value for benefit. So it really is a one-sided 025 p-value. It means that if there's no effect, there's one chance in 40. It doesn't mean that there's one chance in 40 the treatment doesn't work. It doesn't mean there's a 97.5% chance the treatment doesn't work. A lot of people think that. That's not what the p-value means. Two-sided O5 p-value in the right direction doesn't tell me the probability the treatment works. It says, if, I don't know if it works, but hypothetically, if it didn't, what's the chance I would see something this good? That's what the p-value means. It's a frequentist concept. It's not a Bayesian concept. It's hypothetically, if it didn't, is this an unlikely event? But I want to know, what's the probability it works? So I'm a frequentist, yet I do believe that Bayesian concepts make some sense. So in essence, what I'm saying here is I want to understand the relationship between getting statistical significance versus not the experimental result against the truth that, in fact, the intervention truly provides clinically meaningful benefit versus it doesn't. Well, to get at that relationship, I need more than the p-value. I also have to know, prior to doing the experiment, how likely is it that the experimental therapy works? Bayesians call that the prior. Well, back in the 1970s, we had done countless trials trying to show that chemotherapeutic regimens would eradicate undetected microscopic residual disease and, and prevent recurrence and death. Nothing had ever worked. So while everybody who designs their trial is optimistic, hopes their therapy, I'm not asking about your optimism or hope, I'm asking the truly objective expectation. Truly objectively, probably it was 4%. Probably the likelihood that, in truth, 5-FU levamisole, when everything else failed, would be effective was probably 4%. That means if you did 1,000 trials, 4% or 40 of them, in truth, the experimental therapy works. 960, it doesn't. 
Now, what does it mean when you do a trial with 90% statistical power? You hear that 90% power means that if, in fact, there truly is benefit, 90% of the time, the experiment will be positive, 10% it won't be. That's what power means. The false positive error, the p-value, the false positive error rate, what does that mean? That means in the 960 where the truth is the treatment doesn't work, in only 1 40th of those, 2.5%, 24, will the experiment be falsely positive. That means you're going to get 60 positive trials. On those 60, it's not true that 59 are truly effective agents. Only about half of them, 36, are truly effective agents. So that means that if you do a single trial in a setting where it's been really difficult to have any breakthroughs, and you get, a, in fact, people have said to me, Fleming, we should approve this intervention because there's a huge unmet need. Nothing works. You now have a way to improve survival, prevent HIV infection, reduce stroke, irreversibility mortality. Huge, huge need in the public. So that's the setting where you should lower the bar and be more permissive. No, that's the setting where I raise the bar because if, you're pro, if, you're, if you, nothing's ever worked, it means your agent probably doesn't either. And so the fact that you even get a statistically significant result only means you've increased that to a 50-50. But let's say you do a second trial now. Let's say you do that confirmatory trial. If you do the confirmatory trial, now in advance you have a 60% chance because this is confirmatory trials where you have already one positive trial. You go through the same logic, now of those positives, now 98% of those positives are true positives. So if you have two positive trials, now it is true that this agent has a 98% probability of truly being effective. I, I say, in 1962, the U.S. Congress passed what's called the Kefauver-Harris Keith, Amendment. And basically what they said was, after the thalidomide disaster, we need adequate and well-controlled trials to approve agents as effective and safe. You need adequate and well-controlled trials, and FDA interpreted Z to mean two. You need two. And I say often, Congress was a whole lot smarter in 1962 than they are today, or they got lucky because Congress was right. You need adequate and well-controlled confirmatory trials. So in fact, it is the case that these data, in fact, for 5-FU levamisole, are compelling. There is a very high probability that 5-FU levamisole truly works. And by the way, why was it that the first trial, statistically significant for yellow, 5-FU levamisole, and statistically significant for levamisole, one was a true positive, one was a false positive? Well, remember, it's 60%. It's what we should have expected. That it worked out exactly as probability would say it should. For every true, every two true positive, for every two positive results, one of them is a true positive, one of them is a false positive. And I've had so many people say to me, Fleming, you cost us seven years. This result was done in 1984. I moved from Mayo Clinic in 84 to the University of Washington in 84. We assembled, when I came here, the Southwest Oncology Group, the Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group, and the group that I had in Minnesota to re repeat this trial, but it took us seven more years. That cost the public seven years. Okay, I, I grant that was true. But if we'd only done the first trial, what would people use? Labamisol. Why give? Toxic 5-FU as well. Labamisol was just as good. So yeah, we cost them seven years to find out that what they would have done before would have been of no value. I love this. It's not some of the things that we don't know that gets in trouble, things we know that aren't so. That is profound. It's better off that you don't do research at all than if you do research in ways that pursue and publish until you get something positive. If your goal is to get a positive publishable result when you do research, do something else. Because it's actually setting us back when we think we know something that's not true. Yes? For the factorial design? It's a great question. 
So the question is, back to the factorial design that I'm really advocating, and I said the ISIS-2 I loved because they randomized streptokinase yes-no and they randomized aspirin yes-no. And just to add to this, the Women's Health Initiative, in my view, was maybe the most important government-sponsored trial that we've done, which is looking at women's health issues. That was a factorial design, taking women and randomizing to hormones yes-no, vitamins yes-no, diet yes-no, so three factors to see whether or not there was an impact in women for osteoporosis, for cancer risks, and cardiovascular risks. Following 35,000 women for 15 years, and many of the researchers here at the Hutch had leadership roles in the design and conduct of that. Are there disadvantages? Yes, you're, you are adding a little more heterogeneity to the experiment, but more importantly, you can't do it unless the two factors you're delivering can be given in full dose. So oncology, you can't randomize to yes, no, drug A, and yes, no, drug B if you can't give drug A and B simultaneously at full doses. So there are times that you cannot do a factorial design. But in HIV, where we're trying to understand, I mean, how did we succeed so impressively in the treatment setting? Combination therapy, right? How are we going to succeed impressively, and we are succeeding, and we're also failing, we're making progress, not as much as we want, but impressively. How do we enhance our progress in prevention? Combination strategies. Behavioral interventions, yes, no. Condoms, enhancing condoms use, yes, no. Enhancing uh, uh, use of microbicides that are effective, yes, no. Antiretrovirals, yes, no. Vaccines, yes, no. And, and yet, if you can't give those strategies in full dose together, then the factorial doesn't work. But most of those you can. So we should be doing more factorial designs in our setting. Only if you want to understand interactions. So if you, if, if you are of the perspective that the effect of streptokinase will depend on whether you're giving aspirin, now you have to study them as four separate groups. So now you've doubled your sample size, and you've, in essence, lost any efficiency. But many times, those effects seem to be orthogonal or independent. Your primary analysis is to look at streptokinase, yes, no, in all patients, aspirin, yes, no, in all patients, and the subgroup analyses are exploratory. So p-values are interpretable only when you understand sampling context. Some of the take-home messages, please do not publish papers with 37 p-values, okay? Don't, I'm a statistician. I make my money by doing p-values, right? Put me out of work, okay? Do not put p-values in your papers unless it was the principal analysis of the principal endpoint or the principal analysis of a small number of secondaries. Those are the only p-values I, I can interpret. Give point estimates and confidence intervals, descriptive, for all other analyses. Random high bias is real. You will be misled. This isn't a maybe. You will be misled if you explore the data, you see things, and you believe it. They should be hypothesis generating. You need a confirmatory. OK, I get it. I need a, I need a confirmatory maternity ward. So I went to another hospital where there were 22 infants. Prospectively, too, I did it. it was prospective. 11 boys and 11 girls. This is going to be my, my claim to fame. Wait a minute, though. It's not all lost. What could we do? What, what can we do? Combine them. Yes. It's not all lost. I went to another hospital, it was 11-11, but I had 20 against 2, combining as 31-13, p-value 0, 0, 0096. Still two zeros on the p-value. Okay, now come on, I've done scientific process, I got a confirmatory sample. Now, who's the first author? Come on, one of you. <laughs> but the first one gets it. If the two of you, the second one raises your hand, you don't get it to be first author. Who's first author? Come on, guys, gee. Problem? What's the problem? Why is this not impressive? Yes, 
this is still driven by the biased hypothesis generating data set. The science tried to tell me that the 20 against 2 was driven by the data in its bias because why? The confirmatory results showed no difference. But I'm persistent. I'm not going to give up. I'm going to put them together. When I put them together, I'm carrying the bias of the original bias generating data set. You cannot use the data generating, hypothesis generating data set in the meta analysis. We do it all the time, folks. And again, what made this lecture, my, if I have you for one hour, and I'm going to run over a little bit, what made this the most important was, in, in, I think it was in 2004, seven different companies called on me to interpret their data. Every one of them did the same thing. They did a trial. It wasn't impressive. They looked in the females, and it was a great result in the females. Never mind the fact that that means you must be harming the males. Don't bother that. It's great in the females. So they did a confirmatory trial in the females. Minimal difference. Why? Random high bias. Minimal difference. They didn't want to give up. Let's do a meta-analysis in females. They're all female. We'll do a meta-analysis in females. And it's now impressive again. And they published and then they wanted to go to FDA and get regulatory approval. And they wanted to get somebody independent like me to give them my blessing. Well, not remotely would I give them my blessing. <laughs> and yet, somehow in medical research, we don't see what you so obviously see in the case of the maternity wards. But it's the same issue. You can't, if you want to pool the original trial that was unimpressive but had positive results in females with the confirmatory trial in females, your meta-analysis can't be all females. You've got to put those darn males back into the analysis. Okay? You have to use the pre-specified primary cohort in this trial and the pre-specified primary cohort in this trial, which means the only unbiased result you can get includes those males as well. And by the way, when you do, you're going to find out your treatment doesn't work. The meta-analysis post hoc is invalid. Primary objective of a trial, in fact, I challenge you to go out and get 10 protocols after this. You don't believe me, fine. Go out and do your own independent scientific oversight. Find 10 protocols. What you're going to find is wording that looks like this in at least half. To establish my experimental therapy is safe and effective. I'm going to establish. <coughs> really? I always say, at least be objective when you're writing the objective. <laughs> what is the objective? Is the objective to establish this vaccine as safe and effective in preventing HIV transmission? It's, determine it's to determine if. It's to determine whether. That's profoundly different. Are we scientists or are we trying to prove what we want to believe? And it's treacherous if your goal is to prove what you want to believe. Because you will, except you won't. You will think you did, but you won't. I was giving a, a presentation at the annual FDA Industry Statistics Workshop that occurs in September of every year. Plenary session. There were five FDAers and myself in this plenary session. One, there, and it was Q&A part. And one of the questions was, Fleming, I know you are really stringent about these things, but even as stringent as you are, I won't use the word rigid, uh, <laughs> haven't you ever seen a case where exploratory analyses are impressive to you even though the primary analysis wasn't positive? And I said, let me tell you a story. I have seen, and this is not an exaggeration, countless illustrations where a sponsor didn't get an impressive result on their pre-specified primary, primary endpoint, but explored the data. And upon that exploration, built a masterful story <coughs> for why their agent is beneficial. I've seen that countless times. The mystery, the paradox is never once has a sponsor come to me and said, you know what, I got a really impressive result on the primary, but oh, don't worry and believe that, because when you look at everything else, it's not very good. <laughs> I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Are we that bad in pre-specifying what the primary is that we always get it wrong? No. If we get something we like, we stop and we say, celebrate. 
If we don't, we're going to find out a way to convince you that we are. So if you are truly scientifically objective and you're just as impressed by unfavorable things as favorable things, then I'm going to focus on what you're saying more globally. But very few are because of this positive bias. My son, who, was, uh, who did his doctoral studies here in psychology, said, uh, yeah, Dad, we talk about this a lot. It's called cognitive dissonance. It's when you are seeing things more globally, you focus and integrate and accept those things that are consistent with your mindset and your expectations and your objectives. The things that aren't get discarded. So real quickly, uh, he gave me an example of this. Uh, his, uh, when, when he was an undergraduate, he had a professor that was a psych professor that really inspired him. And he told him a story. And the story was that this psych professor had assigned half the class to argue a point and half the class to argue a counterpoint. At the end of the course, when all of the grades were in, they'd, they'd done their final exams, they'd argued the point or the counterpoint, the professor met with the students, just as we do, to try to find out how to make the course better. And the professor was smart, did it after the grades were in, so they would get an objective answer from the students. And, the, and, and at the end of that interview of each of the students, the professor said, oh, by the way, just, just I'm curious, do you actually believe the point or the counterpoint as you argued it? And he said almost everybody believed their arguments. The key was he assigned them at random the point, the counterpoint. So if someone assigns you at a pharmaceutical company, your mission is to establish our therapy is safe and effective, you won't even realize the cognitive dissonance, that the things that are in fact consistent with what you're trying to show get incorporated into your belief system. And one other real quick example, a sponsor did a trial globally showed benefit. The FDA, the regulatory authorities, upon looking at the data said, we think the effect is only in the males. And, and I actually think in this case, the sponsor was right to say, wait a minute, that's really inappropriate. That's post hoc. The effect probably is more likely in all patients. That was a random event, a false negative. There wasn't any real biological plausibility. We had a key opinion leader meeting. I remember working with them. I spent three hours. Generally, I don't end up siding with the sponsor. Generally, I end up siding with the regulatory authorities. In this case, I think the sponsor was right. And so the sponsor, at the end of this three-hour session, said, here's how we're going to present the argument to FDA. First of all, we're going to start by showing the global result was positive, and then, in fact, showing that there was even more benefit in the males. I said, you've just destroyed your argument in the interest of being loving and being persuasive. How can it be that the effect is more than average in the males without it being less than average in the females? And the whole point you were trying to argue was it's not less than average in the, in the females. Therefore, you can't argue it's better than average in the males. They didn't even realize in their interest of being persuasive that they had undermined their own arguments. Last thought here, very quickly. In the setting of lupus, a small company in California conducted a study of abetamisodium to try to reduce the renal flare rate in these patients. And this was their principal product. This was their livelihood. This was their belief. And the p-value was not 0.05. It was 0.5. There wasn't anything happening. This was a huge blow to them. They explored the data, though, and they found that in the patients that had high affinity disease, in that subgroup, the high affinity disease, the p-value was 007. Okay, but that could be random high bias, right? So we have to do a confirmatory <coughs> trial. FDA didn't accept that as a conclusion. They accepted it as a hypothesis had to be generated and to be assessed. So they did a second trial in only the high affinity subgroup, looking at time to renal flare, minimal effect. That first Subgroup analysis was random high bias. But they were persistent. So even though the first trial showed no effect, a post hoc subgroup showed an, an apparent effect, but a confirmatory trial said, no, that was random high bias, they didn't give up. They looked at the distribution of time to renal failure, and while the pre-specified analysis at two years showed no difference, 
at one year there was separation. So during the first year, there was a lower rate in the experimental arm of renal flares. So they said, okay, we're gonna do another trial. The third trial, it's gonna be only in high affinity patients and we're only gonna count the events that occur over the first year. Now, wait a minute. Not only is that dredging my data, tell me why, if you believe in fact, that, the sub, that, that it's in essence a subgroup by time, that you have fewer renal flares in the first year, but more renal flares in the second year, why can we ignore the more renal flares in the second year? I mean, why is it good to have the same number of renal flares but distribute over time when they occur? Nevertheless, that's what they did. So they cut it off at a year saying the third trial will be done by, in essence then, looking at those patients in a high affinity subgroup only counting the renal flares in the first 12 months. And that study was terminated early due to lack of any effect at all. Random high bias again. Could even call it for the people who are persistent or slow learners, i.e. the data told you there was no effect. You believed. You did a post hoc subgroup. You found high affinity patients. And in that subgroup, there was no effect. But you still believed, so you did a post hoc analysis by time. That was noise, too. So in essence, it's critical to understand that you're often fitting noise. I often say, if you torture your data, they will confess. So let's take, let's take a five-minute break. And we're only nine minutes behind. Uh, so and we'll pick up then with discussion about biomarkers. Oh, wait a second. I, I apologize. I did promise, are, are there? Questions from the, just one second, are there questions from the group that is uh, online? Erica is not in the room. Oh, good. So okay. We'll, so let's take your, you, you had one question. Go ahead. Yeah. All right. Yes. Um, so one question was, it seems like the way to kind of hedge against this issue of looking after the fact yes. at what exploratory analyses may show, and what I've seen in one limited clinical trial that I've been involved with is to just pre-specify a ton of different yes. endpoints or build yes. a composite endpoint. Yes. And so that seems like that's also dangerous. Yes, that, you're, you're totally right. You kind of balance that. Where you're the totally right. Is. So the composite endpoint, maybe we'll have time to talk about later at the end of next lecture. Remind me if I don't bring it up, because that's a great point. But you're absolutely right. So what people often do is they say, OK, Fleming, if you need pre-specification, I'm going to define and I'm not exaggerating, 15 covariates, early disease, late disease, high stage, low stage, pretreated, not pretreated, male, female, young, old, on and on. And they say when they actually do then 60 different subgroup analyses and they find one with a p-value that is 0.026, Fleming, it was pre-specified. I said, yeah, along with about a thousand other analyses. If you look at a typical SAP, when you allow for all of the endpoints you could be choosing, all of the different covariate adjustments you could be making, all of the different analyses over time you can do, and my favorite, all of the different subgroups you can do, there are probably a thousand. That's not pre-specification in the, in the sense I'm talking about. Yes, I'm okay doing that because that's assuring me I'm collecting the data for descriptive supportive analyses. Pre-specification is the primary analysis, primary endpoint, and secondaries. I don't want any more than three or four. I don't want 32 secondary endpoints, and you have none. I don't know how to interpret p-values for 32. I kind of, you're pushing my skill set after 40 years to interpret about three or four. So when you write your protocols, critical point you're making is you want one pre-specified primary analysis of the primary endpoint. You want at most three or four complementary secondary endpoints The complement. So if the primary endpoint of a vaccine is, I want to look at, at susceptibility, then very complementary secondaries would be set point, progression, infectiousness, complementary things. Stop. That's it. Those are the additional things I can interpret. Everything else is descriptive. And if it's one of those thousand, don't tell me the p-value of O4 means something. It doesn't mean anything, but you're going to find them all the time. And you are going to, if you get into the medical literature, if you're a journal editor or you're a reviewer, 
you should refuse to review the article now in this internet era unless you are also provided the protocol and the pre-specified analysis plan that existed at the time the database was locked. Because you're going to find out, and how do I know this? I've been a voting member more than 100 times in FDA advisory committees. I see the truth because I see the totality of all analyses. I see exactly what was pre-specified. And I can't tell you how incredibly biased the New England Journal is and every other medical journal. They are hugely biased. And if you work with an industry-sponsored trial, you're going to find that they will write the article. Then they will go to their academic steering committee and present them the article and ask them for comments, hoping they get none. And sadly, we in academia are at fault because most of us will say, fine, I'll publish that. I get a publication on my CV. Well, you have just lent your reputation to their agenda of, of, dis, of using the literature to disseminate their message. In fact, with one, when I was on the steering committee in one of these instances, it was even as bad as the sponsor told me I didn't have a right to see what the reviewers said until they wrote the response to the reviewer comments. I said, I'm the lead statistician. I'm the statistician on the steering committee. You're not letting me even see the reviewer comments until you draft what the response is going to be to the reviewer comments? That's, a, that's company policy, I was told. It is rampant. It is rampant. The medical literature is, is biased. Um, FDA briefing documents are biased. At least the FDA's is unbiased. The FDA are my heroes. FDA are my heroes. They're the one entity, not even NIH are my heroes, FDA are my heroes. They're the one entity that comes into the clinical research arena in an objective manner to try to pursue what is an objective, unbiased assessment of truth. So we need you to be reviewers. We need you to be co-authors. As reviewers, insist on understanding what the pre-specified design was to find out whether you're getting propaganda. And when you're on a steering committee, be willing to be the lone voice. And in this one example, I was the lone voice. I, 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 was, I spent months and months of my time trying to convince scientifically why this report that the sponsor wanted to put out was completely biased. And nobody ever argued in any way against the science of what I was saying. There was never an argument that what I was saying was incorrect. But there was a resistance to doing it because it wasn't the message they wanted to convey. It's rampant. OK, so let's start again at 920.
Um, before Tom uh, starts up again, I just want to uh, make a couple of announcements to our at-home audience. Um, we're apparently having some problem with the streaming, and so I don't know if folks can hear me say this, but if they can, um, if, the, if the streaming is breaking in and uh, coming and going, um, the word from AV is to try Google Chrome as your browser. Uh, or if you're in Chrome and it's not working, try Explorer in your browser and to try um, updating your plugins for either of those if you're having trouble uh, hearing the lecture. Also, I wanted to uh, remind people who are on the streaming that uh, we would really like to know of your presence, uh, electronic presence, watching this from home because we have no way of seeing that. You don't have to register to access the streaming. So please email uh, this email here, Nakia Fraser at FHI360.org with your name, organization, and role, and we're going to uh, send people some free flash drives. So that's your incentive is you can be entered into a drawing, and we're going to try and put your slides on. Okay. So you get not just a great one gigabyte flash drive, but four gigabyte flash drive, but uh, slides as well. Um, and second, for those who are in the room, if you didn't know, the bathrooms are out that door. Very thanks, thanks, Sam. Logistics. Thanks very much, all of you, for your questions. I wish we had a lot more time for the questions, uh, but please do keep asking them, and we'll work them in as, as best possible. Also, this should be informal. I know it's a tight schedule. Our breaks aren't very long. So feel free to get up and walk out the door anytime, walk back in. I, I told Sam, I've, in 30 years of lecturing, I found out a very fascinating observation. It's, I will stop lecturing when all of you are gone, so I won't keep going. Uh, but you know, if you need to get up and walk around, grab something to eat, come back. It's informal. Do so. Don't worry about it. You know, we're not giving you a lot of break times, and this way at least we can spend more time on Q&A. OK, so the second topic, one that is of critical importance, I'll admit it's not as profoundly important in HIV AIDS, partly because it's hard to know what would be a replacement biomarker. What do I mean by a replacement biomarker? If we want to do a vaccine trial, what I really want to know is whether or not, not even really, if I vaccinate you and I don't vaccinate the controls, will you have fewer HIV infections? What I really want to know is, will you have less symptomatic disease and death that's ultimately caused by viral infection? We get viral infections all the time. We don't care about most of them because our immune system takes care of them. But it's not true for HIV. So even HIV infection isn't the true answer. It's ultimately prolonging the time that you are free of any of the clinical consequences of HIV. Uh, and, and yet, I admit, that would be a trial that would have to be done by randomizing communities and following people for 25 years. Even I realize that's probably not feasible. So instead, we'll do a trial that looks at whether you reduce the numbers of people that have transmission, that have HIV infection. But even that could be a 10,000-person trial if you have a 1% transmission rate. In fact, even if you have a 2.5% transmission rate, it's only 250 events. I need at least 250 events to reliably distinguish between a 33% reduction in transmission versus none at all. So it's very tempting to say, how do we make our trials smaller and feasible? And sure, we use replacement endpoints like HIV infection, or worse yet, do we achieve the humoral and cell mediated immune responses that we think this vaccine will have to have in order to, in fact, protect us? Well, gosh, the good news is I could do that with 100 people. So it's very tempting to use replacement endpoints. We don't do them as much in HIV, partly because it's often not clear what they would be. What's a replacement endpoint for a vaginal microbicide? What are we going to use? What biomarker effect are we going to use? So we're actually a little bit saved in HIV because we don't have options that most diseases have. Most diseases have a plethora of biomarkers. So the insights here are important in HIV AIDS. They're profoundly important as you're doing research or as you're a consumer of research across all disease settings because the principles I'm going to talk about here apply across the board. I say one of the reasons I love being a biostatistician is that I get to see everything. I get to be involved in HIV AIDS research, 
in cardiovascular research, in oncology research, in, in MS patients, in rheumatoid arthritis. They're all different. They all have their specific unique elements and issues, yet the fundamental principles that are so influential in design conduct analysis are the same. And you're hearing four of those from me today. So what, you're, what we're covering today is of relevance for those of you that are going to be involved in HIV AIDS research for treatment and prevention. It's also as relevant in all other disease settings. In fact, I'll use illustrations from across disease settings in order to be able to illustrate the same concepts. So when I talk about biomarkers, I like to start with what, what should you think about when you're choosing an endpoint? There are four sets of criteria when you're designing your definitive trial to evaluate the effect of a vaccine or a microbicide or a PrEP intervention or an antiretroviral for prevention of transmission of HIV or for treatment. In, in any of these settings, what should you think about? Well, the endpoint should be consistently and readily measurable. If you're treating patients with primary biliary cirrhosis, predominantly occurring in younger females and fatal over a 10 to 15 year period, if you don't want to wait and find out whether your intervention is truly preventing death due to liver failure or need for liver transplantation, you want to use histologic changes. If you do a biopsy in those women every year, they're not going to hang around for the whole trial. That's a pretty invasive measure if that's a biopsy being done not for true clinical care, but for experimental assessments. Or if you have a patient with primary biliary, with, with um, um, uh, hypertension um, and what you're trying to do is look at right heart caths that you're doing to try to get at biomarker endpoints. Um, right heart caths is an invasive procedure and if it's not something that you would be doing in clinical practice for in pulmonary arterial hypertension then it's going to lead to a lot of missing data and we're going to talk about missing data in the next presentation should be sensitive. We typically are good about finding sensitive measures. In oncology, instead of looking at whether you survive longer, we'll look to see if we shrink your tumor. Well, that's the intended mechanism by which we hope to achieve benefits, so it's going to be sensitive. The question is, is shrinking a tumor reliably telling me whether I'm helping you feel better or live longer? In pneumonia, in pneumonia, one of the great advances in healthcare is antibiotics. In pneumonia. Don't get me started about talking about antibiotics where we use them. Any of you have ear infections or you have children with ear infections or family members with ear infections? And what do you do with an ear infection? You go to see the pediatrician, right, with the child? And what does the pediatrician give you? An antibiotic. Tell me the clinical trials that show that antibiotics work. Well, wait a minute. I don't need a clinical trial. I give my child an antibiotic, and thereafter, their symptoms resolve. Absolutely right. Post hoc ergo propter hoc. After this, therefore, because of this. Right? I give them an antibiotic and it goes away. Do you know what? If I don't give an antibiotic, the symptoms go away just as fast. How do I know that? Because we finally convinced people that we should no longer approve antibiotics in acute hepatitis media based on the fact that symptoms go away after I give them. I need a randomized trial. And when I do that, it doesn't resolve much differently in any way. But gosh, as, a, as a, somebody marketing an antibiotic, I can't make that much money by marketing antibiotics in pneumonia patients where they prolong your survival. I want to give them an acute otitis media, and acute bacterial sinusitis, and, 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 and acute exacerbation of chronic bronchitis, because that's, that's where all the antibiotic use can be. Yeah, and I develop resistance so that where they work, I don't have them. Well, so I use them in pneumonia. How do I assess? How have we assessed the effects of antibiotics nowadays in pneumonia? Not by seeing whether I am prolonging your survival. We, we do that by saying, after 21 days of treatment, we're going to come back and the clinician's going to look at you and say, are you better? Are you better? Better. Does that mean that my chest exa x-ray exams improved or my temperature has come down? Those are signs. Those aren't tangible to patients. What's tangible to patients with a pneumonia is coughing, chest pain, breathlessness, and whether you're dead or alive. Not whether a clinician walks into a room and says, I think you're better. So the endpoint should be well-defined and reliable. 
Most importantly, it should be clinically meaningful. And I am so frustrated with the abuse of that term, clinically meaningful, I don't even use it anymore. It feels, functions, and survives. The goal of clinical research is not in oncology to shrink a tumor. It's not in HIV prevention to change your immune system. It's not in cardiovascular disease to lower your LDL or lower your blood pressure. It's to help you feel better, to help you function better, or to help you live longer. That's the goal of clinical research. So what does that specifically mean? Feels. So I mentioned pulmonary arterial hypertension. Feels. What are the symptoms these kids have and these adults have with PAH? They have chest pain, breathlessness, fatigue, dizziness. Symptoms. Symptoms. That's tangible to a patient. That is a true clinical endpoint. It has to be assessed. Symptoms have to be assessed by the patient. So if you're doing a trial in acute hepatitis media and you want to find out whether antibiotics help your child resolve their symptoms, I cannot go to, I haven't figured out how I can at least, go to a nine-month-old infant and ask them how their pain is. Kids that are nine months old don't do well filling out forms on symptoms. But their parents can tell you whether they are sleepless, whether they're restless, whether they're crying, whether they've lost their appetite. So we can get at other things through observers. But if we want to get direct measures of symptoms, we need patient-reported outcomes. Patient-reported outcomes are clinically meaningful endpoints. Uh, a great guidance by FDA. If you're going to use patient-reported outcomes, this is a great guidance. And there, they are any report that has to come directly from the patient. That's a PRO. And as I say, they have a great advantage of being clinically meaningful endpoints. The problem is if you're going to use these for reliable regulatory and scientific use to establish whether you are improving the course of person based on their symptoms, there are many criteria that have to be satisfied, including things like content and construct validity. Does this instrument truly capture what it is that, that I'm claiming it does? One other critical point, we're going to talk about this in the next presentation. You can't just assess how a person is doing while they're taking your randomized treatment. You can't stop following them when they stop treatment because you're going to get a highly biased assessment of treatment effect if you're not consistently following patients. And I'll talk about that in the next presentation. Well, feels is important, but so is functions. Functions isn't physiologic function. Function is ability to carry out normal activities. So can you carry out the normal activities of daily living? Can you recreate? Can you go to work? Can you go to school? Can you carry out those normal activities? Those kinds of objectives can be assessed by physician-reported outcomes, FISROs, or observer-reported outcomes, OBSROs. Now, it's really not controversial to say that the goal of clinical research is to help people feel better, function better, live longer. If I, even HIV prevention, the goal of HIV prevention actually isn't directly to reduce the number of people who become infected. It's to actually reduce the sequelae, to reduce the clinical consequences, to reduce the symptomatic events that occur with an AIDS-defining event, to prolong the survival. Those are the true clinical objectives. The problem is, and I get this, the problem is to study an intervention for its true effects on feels function survives. Okay, that's feasible in acute hepatitis media. I can find out whether symptoms resolve in three days versus four days. That's not a huge burden. But to show that our therapeutic strategies or our prevention strategies are reducing the burden of HIV as it actually is tangibly experienced by patients or participants, that is a really difficult thing to do because it's going to mean trials that are huge and, or extremely long. And so we recognize that this is what we want to do, but feels and functions takes validated instruments and survives can often take a huge trial that's really long term. So our inclination then is to go to measures of biologic activity. If we're looking at an intervention for treatment of HIV, we typically look at whether or not 
we achieve effects on viral load? Can we render someone to have undetectable virus for six months or a year? Worse yet, we might use, as we used to use back in the 1980s, early 90s, before we had good measures of viral load, we would just look and see how we protected your immune system. Is your CD4 count s sustained? Those are replacement endpoints. The Institute of Medicine in 2010 came out with a landmark document. FDA asked them in 2008, help us understand how to use biomarkers to evaluate interventions for treatment and prevention. And in essence, Institute of Medicine came back with an answer that FDA wasn't expecting, which wasn't you should use these more frequently to reduce the size and duration of trials. They said you have to be much more rigorous in your use of them because back what we were saying earlier, it's not so much the things we don't know that gets trouble, things we know that aren't so. And very often, an effect on a biomarker is not telling you whether or not you're really making a tangible difference to patients. And biomarkers, as, as we see here, are very inclusive. Many things that we use in oncology, in cardiology, in infectious disease, and other areas are actually biomarkers. Measures of biological processes, physiologic measures, blood tests, chemical analyses, genetic and metabolic data, measurements from images. We, in oncology, we're taking images to see your tumor burden. And, and it's called clinical benefit. If I can slow the time it takes for your tumor burden to increase by 25%, we call that clinical benefit. So we, we're even biased in how we name things. I said, the endpoint's clinical. What's your endpoint? Clinical benefit. What's clinical benefit? Delaying a radiologic increase. Patient doesn't walk around with cancer saying, Doc, I tell, you, I tell you what I need. I definitely need to have an extra two months before there is a resist assessed progression radiologically of my cancer. No, a cancer patient is going to say, I want to feel better. I want to function better. I want to live longer. That's what a patient cares about. And biomarkers are... It's interesting. I will talk to people in different clinical areas, and everybody understands why the other clinical areas' biomarkers are really treacherous, but theirs are fine. Everybody believes in their own biomarkers. So we've, we have tried to characterize endpoints. What should endpoints be in clinical trials? On the left are the direct measures of feels function survives, measures by the patient, such as symptoms, by the clinician, by the observer. And I already mentioned, I cannot use pain for acute otitis media because a child, an infant, can't fill out a pain score. But I can use infant behavior by the observer to assess what is that tangible effect to that infant. Then on the other side, we have the biomarkers. Every field has them. Type 2 diabetes, glucose control, hemoglobin A1c, prostate cancer, your PSA, radiologic exams and oncology. In pulmonary arterial hypertension, we use uh, cardiac output uh, and uh, pulmonary vascular resistance, pulmonary arterial pressures that we get from our invasive um, right heart cath exams. And, and in HIV AIDS, we love viral load, CD4. Those are biomarkers. In essence, what do we do? We say, we're going to find a biomarker like CD4. A woman is pregnant. Um, she has HIV infection. We want to prevent transmission of that infection, infection to her infant. Profound observation. The lower her CD4 count, the more likely she's going to transmit HIV to her infant. There's a huge correlation. Lower CD4 count, higher risk of transmission. Therefore, we find a biomarker like CD4, and it's correlated with HIV transmission. And so we show an effect on the biomarker and make the leap of faith and hope that it leads to an effect on the clinical endpoint. And we use the argument that I just met, mentioned, postdoc ergo propter hoc. I give antibiotics to a child with acute otitis media and the symptoms go away. Therefore, it must have been because of the antibiotic. It has nothing to do with the antibiotic. And if I took, and if I treated a woman who was infected with HIV and gave her IL-2 and spiked her CD4 count, 200 cells in the eighth and ninth month of pregnancy, 
it will do nothing to, tr to, affect, to affect the transmission risk from, to her infant. So yes, we can use biomarkers. It establishes biologic activity. So if you have breast cancer and I can delay by two months the time for your tumor burden by radiologic exam to increase 25%, that means it's biologically active. I have no idea if it means that woman's going to feel better, function better, or live longer. Why is that? It's a paradox. Coral does not a surrogate make, is what Demetz and I wrote in 1996. A coral does not a It's a correlate. A surrogate means the effect on the biomarker predicts an effect on the clinical endpoint. That's what I want to know. So why is a correlate not enough? If a disease causally influences a biomarker and causally influences the clinical endpoint, these are going to be correlated. But if this biomarker is not in the causal pathway by which the disease influences the endpoint, the effect in the biomarker won't predict the effect in the clinical endpoint. I've given a classic HIV example already. That's absolutely true. A woman infected with HIV who is pregnant, her CD4 count is highly correlated to the risk of transmission. And if you give her, and we did it, we, we tried this. We did a clinical trial giving these women IL-2 and spiking their CD4 counts. And it worked marvelously to spike their CD4 counts, and it had no effect at all on transmission. On the other hand, if we'd given her an intervention that would have suppressed her viral load two to three orders of magnitude, transmission rate would have gone down. In oncology, we use, uh, in ovarian cancer, CEA, in prostate cancer, we use PSA all the time. Sadly, in prostate cancer, we should leave men alone. Breast cancer, absolutely, it matters. Colon cancer, absolutely, it matters. Prostate cancer, it's nonsense. That your PSA, when it's rising, means that we should intervene and do a, a biopsy and find what will be inevitable if you're over 50, that there is some prostate cancer there. And so therefore, we're going to intervene and do, we're going to do a prostatectomy or we're going to do radiation therapy. And we'll get two tangible consequences, impotence and incontinence. It won't have any effect on transmission or on, on death because nearly all prostate cancer is latent. Most men eventually at some age will have prostate cancer. Only 9% of men ever have symptoms and only 3% of men ever die. So PSA is highly correlated, rising PSA is highly correlated with symptoms and death. It's not why prostate cancer leads to symptoms and death. It's not mediated through a rising PSA. So it makes it good for diagnosis and prognosis. So it only has to be correlated to be useful as a tool to diagnose a disease and to assess prognosis. But it has to be integral in the causal mechanism for the effect on this to predict the effect on what I care about. OK, so many times our biomarkers, there isn't even a green arrow here. They're not on a causal pathway. What if they are? What if the biomarker is on a, this green arrow, arrow does exist, so the biomarker is on a causal pathway? Well, many times there are multiple causal pathways by which the disease process influences the endpoint, only one of which is mediated to the biomarker. If these yellow pathways are dominant causal pathways, not captured by the biomarker, you can get false positive or false negative conclusions. So false negative, an example. Let's stay in the world of immune system irregularities. Chronic granulomatous disease is a disease in children with a compromised immune system. As I understand it, macrophages engulf microorganisms but don't generate an oxygen burst. Hence, it doesn't lead to the eradication of the microorganisms that go on to lead to the clinical consequences of major infections, symptomatic infections that require hospitalization. So the idea was we can give gamma interferon that will biologically restore the immune system's capabilities for bacterial killing and superoxide production. The problem that we ran into, though, was I was the chair of the data monitoring committee for the trial that was placebo control trial of gamma, -ferron, gamma interferon against placebo to actually show whether that strategy would reduce the risk in these children of recurrent serious infections, we were going to have to f follow these kids for at least a year. And the problem was, gamma interferon was given by four weekly injections. So we had to give the control patients four weekly injections of a placebo. And these are kids. Hard to consent kids to taking, in fact, it's not just a placebo. It's weekly injections of a placebo. How can you do that? Is that ethical? Well, we can't consent the kids. We had to consent their caregivers, in most cases the patients. 
But we had major ethical debates about this that engaged NIH, the sponsor, FDA, and our data monitoring committee. Eventually, though, it was recognized that this was in a very significant clinical question. I remember talking to a pediatrician once, and the pediatrician said, I am sick and tired of not doing trials in kids to find out the truth. And this pediatrician said, I'm sick and tired of having to use animal studies. I said, animal studies? Yeah, yeah, studies in adults. <coughs> studies in adults is what we do in order to extrapolate to kids. And that's often wrong. The answer is wrong. Sidenafil, uh, Viagra, except when used uh, in pulmonary arterial hypertension, it's called sidenafil. In children, it's called Rivazio. Well, in adults, you give more sidenafil, you get, you get better six-minute walk results, you get better results on pressures. And you do in kids, too. So that must mean that you get a better result in kids, too. Well, no, we finally did with the pediatric written request, i.e. By, by charging people with ED when using Viagra an extra six months of patent life to pay for the research to look at Rivazio in children, we found out we were killing more children by giving them higher doses. Opposite effect as in adults, but we didn't find out. So we said, these kids, I don't want to give four weekly injections of a placebo in this trial, but kids have a right to, to ultimately being treated better and evidence-based medicine is the way to find out about the truth. So we said our monitoring committee that I was chairing would monitor the data very closely and as soon as there was really direct persuasive evidence about benefit or lack of benefit, we terminate the trial. Well, it was a marvelously effective strategy, 70% reduction in the clinical endpoint. We got the answer within six months. We didn't have to treat these kids for a year. And it was a positive result so that all the kids on the control arm also then benefited at the end of that time by having an effective therapy as well as kids that weren't on the trial. By the way, we then had six months data. The, the thought had been, let's do a one-month trial on a biomarker. That was the proposal that we had to fight against in order to not have to give four weekly injections more than a month. We actually had six months data on the biomarker. There was no detectable effect. So in essence, in this trial, gamma interferon had no detectable effect on the measure that we were going to use to do a one-month trial to save these controls from weekly injections of a placebo beyond a month. And if we'd done that, we would have seen no effect. When there was an effect, because this was giving us a false negative of the true benefit, which either was, and in fact I say in clinical research, you do not find out how it is that your therapy worked. You find out whether it worked. I'll take the latter. Because in the end, my decision to use an intervention for treatment or prevention is based on whether it achieves the clinical objective that we want even if it happens to do it in a way that I hadn't expected. Now, I'd love to know how it happened. I'll get clues about it. But there are no causal data that will tell you how gamma interferon actually did achieve the effect on reducing serious infections. But that's what matters, is whether it achieves the clinical benefit of reducing serious infections. So either, I don't know, Either it affected bacterial killing at a level sig sufficiently important to, in fact, achieve the clinical benefit but not to be detectable, or it had an effect on a different mechanism, such as antibiotic uptake. False negatives, false positives are even a greater risk. So I've talked already about thrombolytics. If you have an MI, you need to have a, a thrombolytic to restore blood flow for the clinical benefit of reducing 30-day mortality. So the objective isn't I want to restore blood flow. The objective is I want to prevent you from dying. I want to improve your survival, likely mediated through an improvement in blood flow. People say, Fleming, come on. You can't, in fact, be critical about patency as a surrogate it's totally obvious what you're trying to do here. These people have to have clot busters to restore the blood flow. Why do you have to do a 15,000 person trial to find out if you're improving mortality when a few hundred people will tell you whether you have restored blood flow? 
So that's what happened in this setting. The gusto, the rapid two trial was done. When was it done? I talked about streptokinase as the first generation clot buster. TPA came along thereafter and was shown to be somewhat better. It became the standard. Now RPA came along. Sponsor wanted to, in fact, replace TPA with RPA. They did the rapid two study and showed that RPA, the experimental, beat TPA, the standard, in terms of restoring normal blood flow, TME3 blood flow, at 60 and 90 minutes after initiation. FDA said that's not enough. That's the biomarker effect. It's establishing plausibility that TPA could be replaced by RPA. But you haven't shown us directly whether or not TPA is, or RPA is at least as good, if not better, on 30-day on 30 on, on 30 mortality. So a 15,000-person trial was done. Boy, the FDA is burdensome. They force us to do these big, long-term trials. Okay, remember that old saying, though, about it's not so much the things I don't know. This trial showed that, did not show that RPA was better on what we care about, which is 30-day mortality. TPA was, in fact, better. So then we went back and looked at RAPID2 again. At 30 minutes, TPA was better. So the point is, even in a setting where I, I know what the mechanism is, it's restoring blood flow. I know my bio, it's my biomarker, it's patency, it's clearly the thing I'm trying to do to achieve clinical benefit. Tell me how you know the magnitude and duration of effect you have to have. If I have a vaccine to prevent transmission of HIV, I need to establish cell-mediated and humoral immune responses, pretty much established. I remember it naively some of us said in 1988 when we began all of this research together that we would have an HIV vaccine in three years. Some of us stupidly said that. Uh, it's now getting on toward 30. Um, it's not just an immune system effect we have to have. What is the magnitude and duration of what you have to achieve? That is really hard to know. But I tell you one thing, the fact that RPA beat TPA and patency at 60 and 90 minutes isn't the right answer because it gave the wrong answer for what we care about, which is preventing 30-day mortality. Well, so suppose your intervention has an effect on not just the biomarker pathway through the the, the pathway through the biomarker, but this yellow pathway as well. The problem is any intervention that is potent enough to do what you want it to do, tell me why in the world you think it's not potent enough to do things that you didn't want it to do. Any, any, th any intervention, whether it's prevention or treatment, if it has on-target effects that are important enough to really alter the risks of irreversible morbidity, mortality, or even symptoms, Tell me why in the world we are so optimistic that it won't also do things that are off target. And I, 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 I'll give you, uh, next year when we do this, we're going to take eight hours. I'd love to take two hours, and that's still not enough, to talk about the countless examples where off target effects dominated on target effects. One classic example. One more time with the MI setting. If you have a myocardial infarction and you have an arrhythmia, that's not a good thing. Epidemiologically, you're at a greatly enhanced risk of sudden death. Well, wait a minute. If arrhythmias put you at a, at a risk of sudden death, we have antiarrhythmic agents like econide and flecainide that are very effective in suppressing those arrhythmias. That's a pretty compelling argument, isn't it? Arrhythmias post-MI are associated with a considerably higher risk of sudden death in a way that mechanis mechanistically makes sense that that's causal. And we have ways of suppressing those arrhythmias. Hundreds of thousands, no exaggeration, hundreds of thousands of patients in this country alone were using econide and flecainide to suppress their arrhythmias post-MI with a pretty ironclad belief that that was going to put them at a much lower risk of sudden death. Nobody ever did an evidence-based study to ver verify that until finally the CAS trial, coronary artery, coronary artery surgery st study, co-led by investigators here at University of Washington said, 
you know, I know this concept. You can't, you can't randomize people to placebo. It's not ethical. I tell you, in 30 years of clinical research, the only thing that to me is what I would want to avoid is not being on a trial. If you come to me with a clinical trial that's going to offer me standard of care versus a promising experimental therapy, the only thing I want to make sure is I'm not left off the trial. Because with the effort that you put in the resources you put into this, you're going to provide enhanced quality of standard of care. Even the control patients are better off than not being on the trial. And in the majority of clinical studies that I've been involved in over 30 years, the control patients have been better off than the experimental patients more often than not. Although not as profoundly as here. Because in this trial, 2,000 patients, this is in a world where hundreds of thousands of people are getting echinite flecainite for the obvious important benefit of suppressing arrhythmias that are associated with sudden death. Nevertheless, we got 2,000 people to be randomized to a placebo, and they were the winners. Because what we were doing in treating hundreds of thousands of people, we were tripling the death rate. We were not only not reducing it, we were tripling it. People got echinite flecainite had threefold higher the rate of death. Does it mean that suppression of arrhythmias, is, arrhythmias isn't a good thing? No, it doesn't mean that. It means that what I didn't intend to do dominated what I did. And the problem is, what I don't intend to do, by virtue of the fact that I didn't intend to do it, is often not recognized. Because it wasn't intended. Nobody, tell me how in the world, short of a clinical trial, you are going to be able to find out that you were killing more people by effects that weren't what was intended in arrhythmia, suppre arrhythmia suppression, short of having a randomized trial. So here's where I'm going to cut it short here. I'd love to talk about, and you might say, Fleming, okay, you gave me the example. No, I didn't. This is recently seven more classes of huge mistakes we would have made by, in fact, using the effect on the biomarker, where in all of these cases, in all of these classes of cases, major in bold off-target effects have led to adverse effects on irreversible morbidity and mortality. So how do you validate a surrogate? You don't, in, in almost any clinical setting, if I ask somebody to tell me how it is that I know a biomarker is valid in oncology, tumor burden. Patients with advancing tumor burdens have more symptoms than death. Yes. Or we call them responders in oncology. Patients who have tumor shrinkage are responders. Patients who don't aren't responders. Unless you guys worry about being in the wrong group here. Don't worry in a minute. I'm going to save you. The fact that responders live longer than non-responders tells me nothing causal. It doesn't mean that the fact that you had tumor shrinkage with your breast cancer and you live longer than you folks with your breast cancer doesn't mean that you live longer mediated through the induction of response. Maybe, it, maybe you did. But on the other hand, maybe those of you who responded had a more intact immune system, which was the causal reason you live longer, and also the causal reason why you responded to a drug because of your immune system. So all we did was put a label on the people who would have done better anyway. There's no causal evidence by virtue of having correlation, and yet in clinical practice, it's how we practice so often. We see biological effects. We lower your blood pressure. We lower your LDL. We reduce your viral load. We, we shrink your tumors because those are, by our understanding, causal mechanisms by which we have clinical consequences of symptoms, loss of carrying out normal activities, or death. And yet, there's nothing causal in being a correlate. What is causal is data that shows that the net effect on the biomarker predicts the net effect in the clinical endpoint. And I remember 25 years ago, people said, we need better statistics. Is that we need better statisticians or better statistics or statisticians with better statistics because in HIV, you know, we needed to be able to do trials without what some of the AIDS activists called body counts. Why were we doing studies in the 1980s as we were by basically determining whether or not 
AZT or the addition of DDI to AZT or DDC to AZT. I monitored 50 trials. I was on the ACTG and CPCRA data monitoring committee for NIAID for 20 years and monitored 50 trials. We were doing body count trials because we didn't have valid biomarkers. And we wanted, we do want valid biomarkers, but the ones that we started with at the beginning, CD4, weren't valid. Eventually, viral load was validated as a way to reliably understand clinical benefit. But essentially, to validate, it's not truly the fact we need better statistical methods. It's that we need richer clinical insight. And I want to defend my clinical colleagues by saying that's really hard. Because what we need to understand is not just the causal pathways mediated through the biomarker. We need to understand all the other dominant causal pathways by which a disease leads to clinical consequences. That's hard. And we need to understand not only what you intend to do, but what you didn't intend to do. And as I mentioned, the problem is what you didn't intend to do is typically not documented or recognized because you didn't intend it. So one classical example, what's a success? One of our major successes in cardiology, if you have coronary heart disease, acute coronary syndrome, is to use lipid-lowering drugs, um, statins, to reduce the risk of MI and death. And we know they do because we've done clinical endpoint trials, not just showing that you reduce LDL, but that you actually do reduce MI and death. One of the major lipid-lowering drugs was atorvastatin, Lipitor, that now has recently gone off patent, which means that many of you will get access to it in a less expensive way. The sponsor for atorvastatin, in the interest of advancing healthcare, and I think also retaining their, their uh, major marketing arena in this setting, said, what if we added torcetrapid to atorvastatin? That could lead us to have an even better effect. And the idea was, while statins are really good at lowering your LDL cholesterol, they don't largely affect HDL. And those of you that know this area know what's good here is to lower LDL and raise high-density lipids, to raise HDL. And the idea was a torcetrapid would raise HDL. That was the objective by adding it to a torvastatin. What actually happened? It worked marvelously. It worked better than we'd hoped. When you added torcetrapid to a torvastatin, not only did, on the principal causal pathway, not only did you successfully raise HDL, you even more successfully lowered LDL than a torvastatin does. That's marvelous. And I think the sponsor was celebrating the fact that, yes, they were losing a torvastatin going off patent, but they were going to trump anything that a statin had done before by adding torcetrapid until the data monitoring committee terminated the trial for harm because you were killing more people with torcetrapid. What was happening? You were activating the renin angiotensin system, increasing blood pressure. You don't want to do that. If you, if in cardiology, lipids matter, blood pressure is profound. So your off-target effect here was trumping the on-target effect. What does it mean? If you're going to use a biomarker as a replacement endpoint for a clinical endpoint, you need to not only understand this causal pathway, the treatment effect on this pathway mediated through the biomarker, but are there other principal causal pathways in yellow? And what are the effects on those pathways? And not only the white intended pathways, but the orange unintended. And this is the biggest reason that I fear use of replacement endpoints is that you're only capturing what it is that you're intending to do. That's pretty biased. That's like saying, we're going to market something, and we're only going to count how much you like the thing that you're buying. We're not going to factor in what it costs. Really? Really? How's that going to work economically? That we're going to go to stores, and we're going to make our decisions about what we purchase, whatever it is, based on how much we like what we're buying but we're gonna have no insight about what it costs in our decision making. Really? I don't think that's gonna work economically very well. 
So in essence, to validate a biomarker, what's really critical is you need to understand not just that green pathway, not just the pathway mediated through the biomarker, but you have to understand the yellow pathways, the other ones. And this is even more important, not just the white dotted intended mechanisms, the orange unintended. So what do you need? You need meta-analyses as well. You need, in addition to this richer clinical insight that will never be fully enlightening, we need data. So I'll give you two examples. Blood pressure lowering. I was on the FDA advisory committee in June 2005 that was looking at whether we could use blood pressure alone to determine whether antihypertensive should be marketed for these clinical benefits. And here's the data that we were presented that shows the relationship between the changes in blood pressure, the biomarker on the x-axis, and the changes in the true clinical endpoints, the rate of the clinical endpoints on the y-axis. This is what we cared about, but this is what we were using as replacement endpoints. And the key here is each dot here isn't a patient. People say, oh yeah, okay, I know how to do this. I'll look at a patient. And if you have a change in your blood pressure that's a lowering of five millimeters of mercury, then we find out that you have a somewhat lower risk of death. And you, who had an increase in blood pressure, had a higher level of death. No, that doesn't tell me that your changes in blood pressure are causal. Because when you had that lower blood pressure, you were fundamentally different in many other ways. And I have no idea whether the effect on your lower risk of stroke was mediated through the reduction you had in blood pressure. Each of these dots isn't a patient. It's not a correlation here. It's a surrogacy. Each dot is a mega patient clinical trial. Each dot is a clinical trial with thousands of patients. Where what we're seeing here is, in this dot, the experimental arm had an extra, on average, nine millimeter mercury reduction in blood pressure and overall, on average, had half the rate of stroke. That's the data that we need to about The net effect predicts the net effect. The net effect incorporates the on-target and off-target effects. The totality, does the effect on blood pressure, the effect on blood pressure, predict the effect on the clinical endpoint? The answer is pretty well, pretty well. But lest we think that this is a relatively straightforward approach, it took 500,000 patients. 500,000 patients. And the reason is because we had to validate that blood pressure lowering predicted benefits on stroke, not overall. We had to do it separately for beta blockers, low-dose diuretics, ACE inhibitors, calcium channel blockers, ARBs. Why? Because every one of those have different off-target effect potential. And so to, it's, it's, if we say in HIV, we're going to study one class of interventions and validate that an immune system change predicts a reduction in HIV transmission, well, it better be only extrapolated to members of that class. If other members have different off-target effects, then the relationship may not exist. The other fascinating thing was effects on blood pressure did predict effects on stroke. That was a success but only moderately predicted effects on MI, cardiovascular death. Poorly mortality and terrible for heart failure, even though all of these are correlated with blood pressure. So yes, we said at the end of the day to FDA in 2005, if you want to know the effects on stroke, it's enough to show the effects on blood pressure in these classes of agents. But otherwise, you need to know what the clinical endpoints are. What about HIV? We did a landmark trial in HPTN, the 015 trial, randomizing to an intensive behavioral intervention versus a control. And what was unique about this trial is behavioral interventions are one of the potential potent approaches we can use to prevent transmission of HIV. But the way they've been studied predominantly have been we will determine whether or not when we randomize you to an intensive behavioral intervention versus a standard of care, whether your self-reported risk behaviors change. Well, yeah, well. So I'm counseling you to change your risk behaviors, and then I ask if you are. Oh, yes, you are. Very good. First of all, it's a surrogate of a surrogate. What you say you're doing about your risk behavior is a surrogate for what you're actually doing about your risk behavior. 
And then what you're actually doing about risk behavior is a surrogate for what I care about, which is HIV transmission. Because what nature of change do I have to have in my risk behavior? And technically, HIV transmission is a surrogate of what I really care about, which is preventing the sequelae of HIV infection. So it's really a surrogate of a surrogate of a surrogate. But that's what we've used. So this trial was landmark because it actually was showing not just the effects on risk behaviors, but on HIV infection. Well, in a sense, it was an aggregation of six trials because we had the 4,300 participants in this trial came from six different cities, each of which contributed about 700, 750 participants. So we said, let's look at this as each city being a trial. So if we looked at each city being a trial, what we see, the question is, are we going to see this very strong relationship that says improve the biomarker effect on average, you improve the clinical outcome on average? Do we get that here? Whoops, I've got to go forward. What we actually got was this. So let's just look at one of these. This is sort of discordant, unprotected anal intercourse. So what we see is of these six cities, five of them showed a reduction in risk of 20%. And they ran, in terms of the clinical benefit, did the degree of reduction in risk correlate with the overall HIV infection? Not at all. I always say, I always say you learn a lot of the skills you need in life in kindergarten. Well, one thing I learned in kindergarten was how to draw a line to connect dots. Okay, the line connecting these dots doesn't look like that line that says that as you have poor results on, on your biomarker, on your risk behaviors, you're going to get poor results on HIV infection. Here it says it almost doesn't matter. There's no relationship between the reported reductions in, in the net effect, your intervention's net effect in reducing risk behavior with the intervention's net effect on transmission of HIV. Again, coming back to, to IOM, a wonderful document saying, IOM said, I need evidentiary assessments, meaning what I need are trials that show whether the net effect on the biomarker predicts the net effect on the clinical endpoint. By the way, that's not to say that we shouldn't use biomarkers. Biomarkers are very helpful for detecting disease, for assessing prognosis. You know, maybe I will use CD4 count in a way to predict whether a mother is more likely to transmit HIV to her infant. That's totally valid. It's totally valid to use it to be prognostic, to randomize the trial to make sure that they have the same fraction of women in each arm who have low CD4 count, so I'm not confounding my analysis. Totally valid to use it as a correlate, but completely invalid to use it as the endpoint. Here are the two areas of greatest clinical utility for biomarkers. We've talked in this presentation about using them as replacement endpoints. But here's the other one. It's using them to target the right therapies to the right people. In oncology, we're doing this all the time now. Oncology drugs fail many times because they only work in a small fraction of people. So we want to use genetic signatures to align the drugs with the people who will benefit. Now, easier said than done because it's highly multidimensional. But if you have colorectal cancer, an EGFR inhibitor works in KRAS wild type patients, but not in mutation patients. The problem is that's not so easily shown. What people typically do is they'll treat a bunch of people and they will see whether KRAS wild type live longer than mutation. That's not what I want to know. That's a prognostic factor. I want to know whether it's an effect modifier. I want to know whether the effect of treatment differs in wild type from mutation. So the problem is where biomarkers have the greatest clinical utility, they are the hardest to use in a justified way. It's highly data intensive. It's very difficult to prove reliably that this biomarker is telling me which cancer patients will benefit and which won't. Just as it's very difficult to prove rigorously that an effect on a biomarker 
whether it's an immune response in a vaccine trial to prevent HIV, or whether it's lipids in cardiology, or whether it's tumor burden in oncology, it's really hard to show that an effect on that biomarker predicts an effect on what patients care about. So one more quick thought here before breaking. There are other intermediate endpoints, intermediate endpoints that are more proximal to what we want to show, but they're actually still not directly what we want to show. In pulmonary arterial hypertension, it's six minute walk or three minute stair climb. These types of measures are very dependent on patient motivation, clinical judgment. That's their downside. They're still indirect measures of what I care about, but they're more proximal. So in pulmonary arterial hypertension, the goal is to help these children and adults feel better, function better. So the measure that's used is six minute walk. How far can you walk in six minutes? 320 meters is typically the baseline. Can I improve that by 50 meters? The point is, if I do, even though there's something that is really face validity, if I improve how far you walk, it seems like you should have more vigorousness. Tell me how much further you have to walk on that test to be able to cross the street before the light changes or to be able to go and carry out normal shopping activities or whatever. That's what I care about. So it's still, it's still an indirect measure, even though it's more proximal than a biomarker is. So in essence, what I'm saying is if what I really care about on pulmonary arterial hypertension are the symptoms, six minute walk is closer to this than looking at um, cardiac arrhythmias or other biomarkers. In HIV, CD4 and viral load is more distal. Maybe you could argue that, and you can argue that HIV infection is pretty proximal to what I care about. And we will use it in mother to child transmission. We will use as the endpoint whether you prevent HIV transmission in an infant because the consequences of HIV transmission in an infant are enormous and immediate. It's not like an adult. In kids, they die within a few years. They have symptoms very quickly. But if you are looking at a new vaccine in adults to prevent heterosexual transmission, this may be a terrible endpoint. Measles vaccines work. They don't work by preventing infection. They arm your immune system when you're infected to prevent the sequelae, and that's all I care about. I don't care if I'm infected by the measles, vac by the measles virus. I care about the symptoms. Well, technically, I don't care if I'm infected with HIV either. I care about the symptoms. And so, in fact, I could use HIV infection as the endpoint in mother to child, but I don't know if I should use HIV infection as the endpoint in heterosexual transmission of HIV because a vac I may be missing effective vaccines. Vaccines for transmission of HIV in adults may only have a modest effect in preventing transmission, may have a huge effect, though, in preventing the progression sequelae and reducing the viral load so that transmission becomes minimal. A vaccine could be incredibly valuable in preventing the spread of HIV, even if it doesn't prevent the, susceptible, the, the partners who are infected from becoming infected. By the way, with these kinds of more proximal measures, there is a little less need for this, i.e., okay, I'm more of a believer that six minute walk and three minute stair climb probably are pretty directly telling me I'm gonna function better. Part of the problem with those measures is assay performance, as IOM indicates. An example of this, I was on the steering committee for an intervention in a rare disease. And basically, the sponsor, ultra rare indication, the sponsor was showing that we were going to improve the three minute stair climb, how many stairs a child could climb in three minutes. The study was international because there, it was such a rare disease. Well, in that setting, in that particular setting, many, we had a number of patients coming from Paris. And the investigators called us and said, wait a minute, we don't have any buildings here more than two stories. Are we supposed to take our kids to the Eiffel Tower to do the test? How about we instead see how long it takes them to climb the two flights, and if that's a minute and a half, we double it, and that's the number of stairs in, four, in three minutes. So wait a minute, you've taken an endurance measure and you made it a burst. So the assay performance is also a, a very key aspect of this. 
In, in conclusion, why, again, why do we care about these replacement endpoints? Why do we care about CD4, viral load, other measures like this in HIV? Um, obviously, it's going to allow us to get a more timely assessment. It's going to allow us to offer people a choice. The problem is, as we've said, the consequences of validating or the ability to validate a biomarker is complicated. Extrapolating it's complicated. We'd mentioned in the setting of, of, of lipid lowering drugs. If one set of drugs shows that when you reduce LDL, that reduces the risk of death in MI, it doesn't mean that another set of drugs that has a different set of effects on HDL or a different magnitude and duration of effects on LDL or effects on unintended mechanisms like blood pressure can be extrapolated to those other agents. And so in essence, it's very relevant and well motivated to try to reduce the size and duration of our trials that are definitive trials in HIV prevention and HIV treatment or other clinical settings by using biomarkers because we want to give people a choice. But the key is not just to give a timely answer, it's to give a reliable answer as well. And so the, the issue is, is it an informed choice? And very often it isn't. And again, we come back to what we had talked about before. It's not so much the things that we don't know, it's the things that we know that aren't so. So in essence, in designing trials, we will be constantly addressing this tension of how to define the endpoints in ways that give us the ability to get timely answers. But it's going to be critical to be sure we have the proper justification for the measures we use. You know, if we use effects on viral load, if we use effects on CD4, even if we use effects on HIV infection, are those measures truly telling us reliably how this therapeutic strategy is affecting how we are in fact impacting how people feel, function, and survive? Um, are there, so we, we are in essence, close to the end here. Are there questions? Are we linked in for questions from those that aren't in the room? Or should we? OK, very good. Then we can stick in the room. Um, I, I think of what you're saying makes perfect sense for proof of principle trials or, or, or actual efficacy trials. But yes. one thing that we struggle with in the HIV vaccines is really how do you move a trial forward from a phase one to a phase two, right? Yes. So you, you absolutely depend on having these surrogates. There's no way around it. Yes, you there do. There are no endpoints. Yes, you do. But there are no endpoints. There won't be clinical endpoints, you're saying. Right, because we are, we're rolling low-risk yes. individuals. There's yes. not going to be HIV infection or viral load or CD4 yes. counts or yes, anything of that matter. So while you're commenting there, let me just quickly go back to say I completely agree. Uh, and if I can quickly find it, so I'm going to jump ahead here. Uh, it's, it's absolutely the case that when you are doing proof of concept trials, phase one, phase two. In fact, I often say the biggest reason for a failed phase three trial is inadequate phase ones and phase twos to establish proof of concept or, or, or um, in, in essence, screening evaluation. And so one of the ways that we properly use biomarkers, even if they're only correlates, is as primary endpoints in proof of concept and screening trials, which is the very point you're making. So if we're going to do a multi-thousand person vaccine trial, even if we're using HIV infection as the endpoint, it's gonna be a multi-thousand person trial. If we're gonna invest in that, we really need to have good proof of concept because the biggest reason those trials are negative is because we haven't screened out interventions that in fact aren't adequately biologically plausible. So you're right, we want to establish then in those screening trials or proof of concept trials that we get the right effects. Now, do we know what the right effects are? Do we know how to characterize cell-mediated humoral immune responses, the magnitude, the durability, the breadth? And I took a particularly hard example when I said it. HIV vaccine, this is really hard because there's such a breadth of the ways we can characterize biologic activity. It's a little easier in cancer. Can I shrink your tumor? Can I sustain the tumor volume for a while longer? And so it's a little easier to do the proof of concept there on the biomarker. Uh, I don't know what the biomarker would be if I wanted to screen a, a, a microbicide, a batch of microbicide, 
what am I going to use? And so what we've done at HPTN in these settings is we've done what are called phase 2B screening trials. We will actually use HIV transmission as the screening endpoint, but we will do a trial that's not fully powered. It's about one quarter the size of the phase 3 trial to give us clues. And I often say a good clue about the right question is better than a reliable answer to the wrong one. I actually, I actually think even with the HIV vaccine that maybe the, I should be doing a screening trial not using as a principal outcome cell mediated immoral human responses, but actually using HIV transmission and get a screening assessment of whether it looks like there's a right trend toward reducing transmission such that I'm now more likely to have a positive result in my validation trial. So we've done this out of necessity. We've done this in HPTN when we've looked at microbicides. We've done our screening trials looking at HIV as the endpoint in the screening trial, underpowered. Well, you have the option in vaccines to use a biomarker fully powered. But my biggest worry there is, but what is the right bio biomarker to choose? What's the right way to characterize cell mediated in humoral immune response? Yes? Can we go back to the, the composite endpoint idea here? Yes. And how you can use changes in viral load, for instance, and look at a composite endpoint for the primary endpoint and the kind of pitfalls of doing yes. that. Yes, so it's a great question. Um, one of the ways to be empowered to get a better, more comprehensive answer about what people care about in a smaller sample size is to not just look at one component. So let me give an example where it's worked marvelously. Again, cardiovascular disease. If we just looked at whether lipid-lowering drugs affected death, it's going to take a huge trial. But stroke's a pretty bad thing, too. And MI is a pretty bad thing. All three of those, cardiovascular death, stroke, and MI, they're all irreversible morbidity and mortality. It's called MACE. So if you do trials in cardiology, they use the composite, death, stroke, MI. And it's one of the few composites where I can say, I almost don't care how you've won because every one of them is profoundly important. But to give a counterexample, in, in knee replacement, when Zymelegantran was being studied, I was on the FDA advisory committee, they used death stroke MI, but they also used asymptomatic distal DVT, asymptomatic distal deep vein thrombosis. Why? Because it gave them about 10 times as many events. And why? Because they had a big effect on asymptomatic distal DVT. So they produced this trial that showed on the composite of death, stroke, MI, asymptomatic distal DVT, a marvelously positive result. And I looked at my colleagues on the advisory committee and I said, you know, I don't want an asymptomatic distal DVT, but I don't know what it means to prevent it. I know what it means to prevent death, stroke, MI, and my cardiology colleagues agreed with me. Then when we looked at the components that weren't asymptomatic, distal DVT, when we looked at death, stroke, MI, pulmonary embolism, major bleed, it was going in the wrong direction. So the things that I knew really mattered, we were hurting. The thing that I couldn't understand what its clinical consequences, although it kind of sounds like what I don't want to happen, I had a great effect on. That's the downside to a composite. So if we do a trial in HIV for prevention and we are looking at components that are all, in fact, equally clinically compelling, then a composite is an effective way to go. But if we add a component which is affecting the HIV viral set point, so we don't affect, we don't impact HIV infection, we don't impact progression to symptoms, we don't impact transmission, but we do impact your viral set point. What does that mean? It sounds like, yeah, I want to impact that, but I don't really know what it means. So a change as strong as its weakest link. It's a great thing to think about. It's a great point you raise. It's a great thing to think about. But remember that if you show an effect on death, stroke, MI, asymptomatic distal DVT, that's not an irreversible morbidity mortality endpoint, even though three of the four components are. It's only a asymptomatic biomarker. Okay, I think we are, uh, since we are reconvening for the next session at 10.30, and it's 10.30, we probably should break. No, <laughs>
Yeah, we'll keep going. So let's take about a 20 minute break. Well, I just want to maybe we squeeze it to 15 minutes. Okay, just a 15 minute a break little. and we'll reconvene at 1045. Yeah. Sorry, I know that gives you less chance.
Move on. We need the political will to do the right thing to provide treatments to everyone by virtue of So I, I, I'd say, yeah, we owe blacks in developing country settings a huge improvement in what we're doing. I think we're on a pathway toward achieving that. We're not there yet, but I think studies like 052 are telling us we have to treat everybody. And by the way, so well, Tom Ebola finishes is the, up. Is For those of you problem. who just joined, I'm going to pass around the sign sheet. Sure. If you could just we let us know your presence here, everybody. here, and I think we're going to run out of space, which is a great problem, problem to have. So if you just flip the sheet over and continue on the back, that would be great. Um, just to do a little pulse take where we're at, for those of you just joining, we've had two of our four talks so far already um, on confirmatory and exploratory analyses and biomarkers and surrogate endpoints. We're now moving into missing data in clinical trials, how to address that address that issue. Um, also, for those who might be joining us on the uh, internet, please do email Nakia Frazier to let us know that you are here and you'll be entered into a raffle to get a free four gig hard or, uh, pin drive with today's slides. Thanks. Thanks, Sam. But I have a new idea here. You said some of have just joined us. I really enjoyed the last two hours. Your questions were great. I wish we had more time. Since some people are joining, let's start over again. <laughs> and we'll get even more Q&A. You said that you were kind of unstoppable once you got into right. this mode. Right. And I'm, I'm good till 5 o'clock. Yeah. I know <laughs> you've already told me that that's not going to happen. But OK. Well, you some have are, and, and, and I love your questions outside, too, of the sessions. I wish we had time to cover all of them. Keep asking them. We'll cover as many as we can. One of the questions that somebody asked was a great one, as were other ones, a great one saying, you talk about factorial designs, and those factorial designs maybe are randomizing you to a microbicide versus a control, and then maybe randomizing you to an, a behavioral intervention versus standard of care. And do you create scenarios where, by virtue of having more complex interventions, there's a greater risk for missing data? And that's a very good insight. I think that's true. I think the more complex the trial design and the interventions that we're offering, the greater the risk there will be for misperceptions about what we have to do in terms of follow-up. And so my answer to that is I agree with that insight. But I don't think the answer is we shouldn't do factorial designs. I think the answer is don't leave yet. Let's hang around for the next 45 minutes and talk about this because while it's harder to get good follow-up in more complex trials, it's solvable. And what's really important is that we have limited research resources. It's important to design our trials to learn as much as we can in the most efficient way. And what I love about a factorial design is it not only answers two questions in the same trial, it actually gives us insights about something even further, which is the nature of synergism. And again, we, we know that our progress in HIV treatment that's been incredible was greatly enhanced by the synergy of multi-drugs. And it is very, very likely that in prevention, it's the same idea. Our, our greatest successes will occur by properly addressing or maximizing preventive strategies that are behavior-based, that are microbicide-based, that are condom-based, that are uh, uh, antiretroviral-based, uh, vaccine-based. All of these will contribute. OK, missing data. So why do we care? Well, we want reliable results. We want to know that in the end, when we're claiming that we are identifying an intervention that's effective or ineffective, that there's reliability about those conclusions. And as a statistician, I might say there are maybe two key features that impact my reliability. Um, there is a truth. This vaccine will have some true level of benefit on an endpoint. Let's say the endpoint is HIV infection. There is a truth. Um, I can have higher variability or lesser variability, and I can have bias. The variability may not be around the truth. I don't like either one. I don't like bias or variability, but one of them I fear much more than the other. Any guesses? What, what's, the, what's worse? Bias. bias. I, I agree with that. If I have variability, 
I actually have ways of quantitating that. I know what the variability of my experiment is. So I realize that if I'm getting this variability around, at least it's unbiased around the truth, I have a sense about reliability. But if it's bias, I don't know if there's variability, what it's telling me, because I don't know if it's a biased result, if that's variability that's even close to being around what the truth is. So I've often said, if you're going to give me, and I'll talk a lot in this example today about a vaginal microbicide as a strategy. If, you're gonna, if, if, if we're going to pursue that, I would love to have a 2,000 person trial with high quality. But if you give me an option, a 2,000 person trial with irregularities or a 400 person trial with high quality, in a heartbeat, I want the latter. In a, in a heartbeat, I'd rather have the 400 person trial done with high quality i.e. variability without bias, than the 2,000 person trial that has considerable precision around something that I have no clue as to whether it's the truth. So a lot of this discussion then will be, even though we care about variability, how do we address the issue of bias? Well, one of the ways is randomization. And it's, it's really integral to causality. Correlations aren't causal. The fact that people that respond live longer than non-responders is telling me nothing about whether the survival was mediated through the response. Randomization does tell me causality. If we randomize you to a vaginal microbicide and you to a gel and there's a difference in HIV transmission risk, that's causal evidence that that reduction in HIV transmission was mediated through the, the intention to use the microbicide. Adherence matters too. If you're not adherent to what it is that we're trying to deliver, then the likely benefits are much less. And that is what I think many of us would see as one of the biggest roadblocks we've had with progress to date in microbicides. One of the reasons I love vaccines is that if we get an effective vaccine, it's going to be safe, it's going to be effective, and it's going to give me durable adherence without having to worry about whether somebody is using the intervention at each time when there's risk behavior. My focus of this discussion will though be on intention to treat analyses and on achieving high levels of retention and how these are integral also to bias. So we'll talk today about these last two categories. So, ah, you know, again, Fleming gets all upset about things that are just so easily fixed in other ways. If there's missing data, don't worry about it. We have statisticians. They'll LOCF you, okay? Or they'll complete case it, or they'll do a worst case analysis. So what do we mean by this? So in um, pulmonary arterial hypertension, as we've talked about in some examples, where a six minute walk is often used in the past as a registrational endpoint. If we wanted to assess that, and we typically do, we look at it every eight weeks at your sick, how far you can walk in six minutes. But the primary endpoint's at 24 weeks. Well, if you're assessed at eight weeks and you don't come back at 16 or 24, then what do you do? You're missing at the primary endpoint. Well, we'll LOCF, it means we'll take the most recent assessment and we'll move it forward in time. And that's classic measure, that's the classic approach used to address missing data in that setting. Or a complete case you. Well, we, we will only count the people who are assessed. If you didn't get assessed, you're just out of the analysis. Or worst case you, if you didn't get assessed, we'll presume that you had the worst thing that could have happened. Well, okay, there's one thing that I can say about those methods. They're simple and it's understandable what they're doing. What I don't like about them is they're simplistic, they're naive, and they're highly biased because a method that I use to address missingness ought to be thoughtful and representing what is likely to have happened had I measured you. So I've had people who have done HIV infection trials where we've tried to reduce the infection rate from let's say over two years from 5% to 2.5% and their approach is if you're missing the assessment over two years we'll count you as an event. Really? So you end up with 16% events on one arm and 14 on the other. 
the endpoint is now basically not, does this intervention reduce your likelihood of having HIV? It's, does this intervention increase your likelihood of being assessed? Believe me, people don't take interventions to increase the chances that they'll be evaluated by you later in time. That's not the goal of clinical research. The goal of clinical research is to provide tangible benefit, to prevent transmission of disease. If, in fact, this was a, a pancreas cancer trial, and it was a two-year endpoint, where 90% of people die on the control, I want to reduce that to 80. If someone doesn't come back and I count them missing as dead, that's probably right. So worst case makes sense in a setting where if you're missing, it is because you're almost assuredly a failure. In an HIV prevention trial, if you're missing, you're almost assuredly not a failure. Counting you as a failure has changed the endpoint from HIV transmission to ability to follow. Well, placebo could do great there. If placebo has no toxicity, you might be able to follow all the placebos. So a placebo arm might have a 5% transmission rate and a 7% event rate, because everybody's followed. And a great vaccine might have a 1% transmission rate, but a 9% failure rate, because some of the toxicities might lead you not to be followed. That's ridiculous. That's a great vaccine. But you've lost that on a ridiculous way of handling missingness. LOCF, I'll come back to that one more time. I was, I was brought in as an outside advisor for a trial of a major intervention in pulmonary arterial hypertension, where the goal was, at this time, to prevent loss of visual acuity. So in, in, uh, in actually, I'm not, not pure pulmonary arterial hypertension, my apologies. It was in the setting of age-related macular degeneration where in age-related macular degeneration, the clinical endpoint is loss of visual acuity. You know, where you go to the ophthalmologist and you, you're getting your glasses and you have glasses, you're, you're doing the eye test and you're looking at how many letters you can see. These patients lose about 15 letters in two years of visual acuity. So the goal was to prevent a drop in visual acuity. The way they handled missing data was to LOCF you. I said, wait a minute, I have the answer then. I'm going to treat you, oh, you guys are unlucky. I'm going to give all of you the Fleming therapy. Whenever I give you the Fleming therapy, you should leave the room, right? It's not a good thing. You're all getting the Fleming therapy. You're getting nothing. You're, pl you're the lucky ones again. The placebos are lucky. Okay. All the Fleming therapy does is it's so toxic that you drop out of the trial after two weeks. Okay. Well, according to the protocol, we were LOCFing you. Well, you didn't have any visual acuity loss in the first two weeks. Therefore, the Fleming therapy is marvelously successful because nobody, according to analysis, has any loss in visual acuity, while the controls will have, on average, 15-letter loss over two years. That was the primary analysis. It's absurd. It's absurd. The Fleming therapy wasn't doing anything for you, but by the way the algorithm we were using for missing this made it look like it was. Complete case analysis. Oh, no, that seems good. Well, is complete case analysis good? So this is, in fact, the actual data from one of these age-related macular degeneration trials. Actually, this is, this is now a trial from pulmonary arterial hypertension. We're using six-minute walk. So this is the six-minute walk result in a PAH trial, where this is the actual data on the experimental arm. Over the period of six months, there was about a 40 to 50 meter improvement. I'm not showing you the placebos, but the placebos had no change. So this was, so we were able, for these kids and adults, to improve their distance that they could walk in six minutes with PAH from 320 meters to about 370 meters, a 50 meter improvement. Now, at the end of that six months, at the end of week 24, these patients were then just followed ahead. So the randomization period ended and all of the intervention people were followed. The sponsor wanted to be able to say something about how durable the effect was. And so they said, okay, in a randomized control trial over six months, we had a 50 meter improvement on treatment. Control had no improvement. And look at this. The effect is sustained out to four years. We said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, though. You didn't follow all of these patients for four years. You kept following them as long as they were willing and healthy and <coughs> vigorous enough to come back. We said, this is highly biased by missing data. And one way that we speculated you could show this would be to say, these patients were being assessed every three months. We said, look, let's split the people at, let's say a time, let's take the people at 24 months and go back to 21 months. At 21 months, let's look at those who were 
going to come back at 24 versus those that dropped out after 21 to see if the ones who are dropping out are really worse. And it's exactly what the data shows. It's exactly what the data shows. So what you're seeing here, just to give you an example of two of these dots, these are the people that were assessed at 21 months for their six minute walk based on whether they would be assessed again at 24 versus no, this was their last assessment. The people who were about to drop out were down to no difference in, in their six minute walk, no improvement. Whereas those who were assessed and are gonna come back had a 50 meter improvement. So these our data are compelling that as patients start to decline, they stop coming back. And so you're getting a highly biased assessment when you're only assessing the people who are. So here's a case where at least at least LOCFing is a little better because at least we keep this person in the analysis and say they're zero. And so by putting them in, you, see, you start to see some decline. But this is still highly biased because that person who was assessed at month 21 that had no meter, no meter improvement, at month 42, at month 48, they weren't still at zero. They probably, many of them had died. And by the way, death is not missing data. If you are dead, I know how far you're walking in six minutes. Most people who are dead walk zero meters in six minutes. I feel pretty comfortable about making that assumption that people who are dead aren't walking any distance in their six minute walk. So it's not missing data. And if 320 meters at baseline, that means they're minus 320 meters. So that means that this person who, was, who dropped out at month 21 that was back to their baseline at 320, maybe they were 370 at one point, they're back to their baseline at 320. Out here, they may be at zero if they're dead, or if they're alive, they may be at 200 meters. So while LOCF here was better than complete case, it's still very bias inducing. The bottom line is, if you wanna understand what the effect is of a therapeutic strategy against a control, you have to follow everybody including people who've stopped treatment, including people who aren't doing well, or you're gonna get a biased analysis. In truth, this intervention arm probably has a truth that looks like this. At 48 meters, maybe on average, they're 20 meters worse. But that could be a great result, because the controls could be like this. The controls might have an average of 100 meter loss. And so you will find in many, part, in many times in clinical research, you will do a randomized trial for a short period of time, like six months, but it's a chronic setting where we care long-term. So they'll say, well then just follow people in a convenience way long-term to get added insight about efficacy and safety. I call that nonsense research. So ex 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 extended periods of follow-up on a randomized trial where you're no longer maintaining randomization and where people are being followed by convenience has only one benefit, it's patient access or participant. It's giving participants access to the intervention. It's not science. It's not giving you a way to interpret what the actual causal effect of an intervention is longer term. So if LOCF and complete case analysis and worst case analysis are highly biased, what is the way to address missing data? And I actually say there's only one. There's only one effective way to address missing data, and that is not have it. Thank you. <laughs> Statisticians don't have a magic wand or ability to make it right when you have missing data. The only effective way is to prevent it. So how do we prevent it? So I'm, gosh, I, I feel like I'm such a prevention guy. I love HIV AIDS prevention research because I feel like it's the way forward to the biggest impact on society is prevention. Well, the same thing is true in quality of clinical research conduct. The best way to address missing data isn't to find some highfalutin fancy way, statistical methodology to treat it. It's to prevent it. So, okay, that sounds great. Say, Fleming, come on, we try. We try when we do studies to prevent it, uh, a little bit. We try what's convenient. So there are six, eight, 10 ways that we don't typically do that are of huge potential impact to further reduce missingness. The first is the terminology we use. 
again, I, 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 I encourage you to go look at a protocol and look at the use of the term off study and how that's used. It's not distinguishing between being off study follow up, which is a retention issue, being off study treatment, which is an adherence issue. Those are profoundly different. You look at a protocol and they'll say reasons for off study are patient can't tolerate therapy, patient choice to stop therapy, physician decision to stop therapy. Okay? Those are all legitimate reasons to stop randomized treatment for non adherence. None of them are legitimate reasons to stop the follow up, which is retention. There's only two reasons that you'd ever, you should ever stop following a person in a clinical trial. One of them is if they die. I get it. Once they're dead, you can stop following them. Okay, record it. You captured what you, what you can and what you need. The other is withdrawal of consent. So if they withdraw consent, then that's a valid reason to stop following them. The problem here is withdrawal of consent is a term that's completely misused and abused in many settings. Withdrawal of consent doesn't mean the person wants to stop their randomized treatment. It doesn't even mean they want to stop their randomized treatment and stop coming back to see you as a caregiver. It means that they're so disenchanted with the trial that they not only want to stop their randomized intervention and stop coming back, they don't even authorize you to make efforts to contact them or to use a death index to find out if they're alive. That's withdrawal of consent and it needs to be patient initiated. It's very easy in a trial where you are treating a person periodically to say, once, I stop, once you stop your randomized intervention, it's a microbicide trial. It's a woman who's receiving a microbicide. And she's coming back periodically for new supplies and encouragement, et cetera. Once she decides she wants to stop that randomized intervention, it's a lot harder to follow her. It's very tempting for the caregiver to say to that participant, maybe you want to withdraw from the trial then. If you want to stop the randomized therapy, since the randomized intervention is no longer being offered, maybe you're interested in just stopping follow-up. And if that woman in that case does in fact sign a withdrawal of consent, that's not withdrawal of consent. Withdrawal of consent isn't, particip isn't caregiver initiated. It's got to be initiated by the participant and it should be written, and it should in fact reflect her interest in not even allowing you to follow her on your efforts. And that is a 1% event. How do I know this? Because I've monitored over 100, almost 200 clinical trials now, and, and, and I watch for this at the beginning of trials. In all, HIV, in all disease areas, and it comes back at five or 10%. I said, I don't believe it. Go back and, and explain what is, in fact, withdrawal of consent. And you talk to those caregivers at those sites and find out if these are truly participant-initiated wishes to have no further contacts made to them by the caregivers. And then they come back, oh, it was 7% last meeting. It's actually 1% when you, when you find out. Why does it matter? Example, rivaroxaban, I was on the cardiorenal advisory committee about a year ago. Rivaroxaban was being studied in acute coronary syndrome for affecting death stroke MI. 18,000 person trial showed a statistically significant effect on a clinically relevant endpoint with 12% people missing. And FDA said, well, the sponsor is not entirely at fault because eight of the 12 had withdrawn consent. So 12% of the trial randomized people were missing. 8% of the trial randomized people had withdrawn consent. Another 4% were missing for other reasons. The IRBs didn't let them go back and recover data in people who'd withdrawn consent. I said, the IRBs are right. I wouldn't either. The problem is the, the participants didn't really withdraw consent. It was a misinterpretation and a miscoding. So it was the fault of the sponsor and the investigators for not coding it correctly. If you code someone as withdrawal of consent, an IRB is probably going to tell you you cannot pursue them. And if they'd withdrawn consent validly, the IRB is right. But it's a convenience and misused characterization broadly in clinical trials that actually negatively impacts our ability to truly follow people who are, in fact, not really wanting to withdraw consent. 
There's also lack of clarity in the informed consent process. We do, as we should, a really good job of letting study participants know that they have a right to withdraw from a trial at any point. It's absolutely the case. We must and do effectively tell people that they have a right to withdraw consent. We don't, though, typically tell them the consequences of withdrawal of consent. And it seems to me that I don't want to coerce someone to not withdraw consent, but it feels as though we should be empowering them to make informed choices. People join trials not just for their own benefit. They join trials for altruistic reasons. I remember saying that when I was giving a short course with Janet Wittes uh, about uh, five, 10 years ago. And I had said in that time that people join trials not just for their own benefit, but altruistically. And Janet said, yeah, I can tell you about that. She was the chair of the Data Monitoring Committee for the Women's Health Initiative I was telling you about earlier, this 35,000 person, half billion to $1 billion US government sponsored trial, randomizing factorially women to hormones, yes, no, diet, yes, no, vitamins, yes, no, for cardiovascular cancer and osteoporosis outcomes. And as you may know, that landmark trial yielded an, a, a very significant surprising finding that hormone use by women was actually increasing cardiovascular risk, not decreasing it as we had thought from epi studies. So <clears throat> because the trial was continuing on to look at these other factors, these women had to be reconsented. DMC said you got to reconsent them to, data monitoring committee said you got to reconsent them to allow them to, to continue. So the women were reconsented and, and Janet said it was stunning that almost every woman consented to continue in the trial. And the predominant reason was they weren't in the trial for themselves. They were in the trial for their daughters and granddaughters to provide enlightenment about how their lives could be improved with healthcare. Well, we don't tell participants who join trials that if they withdraw, it's worse than if they hadn't come in at all. Anyone who joins a trial and withdraws consent induces informative missingness that not only renders their own contribution null, but it compromises many others in the trial in their altruistic contributions. I don't want to force anybody to stay in a trial, but it seems as though they have a right to know the consequences when they make a decision, and we don't. We don't enlighten people in the informed consent process that they have this right, if they do choose to exercise it, it will significantly compromise the interpretability of the entire trial. ITT analyses, uh, what are they and why are they important? Why do people like me get so anxious about a per protocol analysis? So let's talk about an example that I'll use to illustrate in this and the next topic. Let's go back to our microbicide trial where we're going to try to reduce, empower women. Um, condoms are an effective approach, often male controlled. Let's empower women through a vaginal microbicide to further reduce risk of transmission. So we randomize all of you on this side of the room to the active microbicide and to, to a gel. And the reality is one of the big challenges that we know we have with microbicides is to get proper consistent adherence. I think the chances that they will work are considerably high, or at least considerably higher, if we're using them consistently. So we've, all of you have been randomized to the microbicide, the active microbicide. Let's say those of you in the front rows are inherently less adherent. Those of you in the back rows are more adherent. So let's say those of you in the front rows stop using the microbicide fairly soon. Those of you in the back rows continue on. There sure is a strong inclination to say, look, the microbicide can't work in those people who aren't using it. So if we want to assess its effect, it's silly to take all randomized people, randomized to the microbicide against all randomized controls. Let's enrich this study by looking at the three back rows of the people who are randomized and are using it and compare them to the controls. That's more what you might call a per protocol use or an on treatment analysis. Seems kind of logical, except for the following. The people who choose to not use this are not a pseudo random subsample of all of you. And as an example, it may be that 
the people who are not using this are inherently less adherent by nature than the people who are. Which might mean that they're not using the microbicide might also mean they're less likely to be using condoms. So let's say hypothetically that's the case. That randomization worked, and it does. We're going to have the same fraction. So on this side of the room, we're going to have the front two rows also that are people that are inherently less adherent, just as they are here. And those in the back rows that are inherently more adherent. If someone is inherently less adherent, they're less likely to be using condoms, then you folks in this row are going to have a much higher transmission rate than you folks in the back rows. So would you. If I leave these people out of my analysis because they weren't taking the microbicide, even if the microbicide has no effect whatsoever, I'm going to show a much better result in the group that is analyzed in the microbicide group in the controls because I have in the microbicide group only the condom adherent people, while in the controls I have both the condom non adherent and the condom adherent people. So the intuition that you might have to say, I got to get rid of the people who aren't taking the microbicide to assess its effect. No, you can't do that because you've lost randomization. And so it's actually not a, much contrary to maybe some of your intuition. The question isn't whether the microbicide when used is effective. It's whether a therapeutic strategy that intends to use a microbicide as that strategy differs from a strategy that intends to use a standard of care. All of you count in that strategy, even the ones who choose to not use it. You're part of the intention to treat analysis. And randomization only preserves the integrity of the intention to treat analysis. So this is one of the, I don't know if you would agree with me, but I, I think this is a beautiful thing about life. How often is it that the only thing that you can do is actually the right thing? And so in this case, the only analysis that you can do that preserves integrity of randomization is the analysis that includes everybody. I actually think it's the right thing. I think it's the right thing because don't tell me whether I should use a vaginal microbicide on the basis conditionally of what it will do for me if I take it. You can't tell me if I'm in that group. If I don't take it, it may be because it induced epithelial disruption. I can't leave out the bad things when I'm deciding whether to follow a strategy. So in this case, the right answer, I strongly believe, is not what's the effect of the microbicide if you take it. It's what's the effect of a strategy involving the microbicide as an intention. Because that's what I'm choosing between at time zero. And beautifully, that is the analysis that randomization preserves. So even if you disagreed with me and say, Fleming, you have your opinions, I want to know what the effect is conditionally if I can take it. You can't, I can't tell you that. You can't tell, you, you can't tell me either what it is because you don't know who the control people are for you. You cannot leave out the non-condom users in your arm and put the non-condom users into the control arm. You can't do that. And so ITT is the only right answer, which means then that you got to follow these women who stop taking the microbicide. Well, again, I get excited, and I probably don't have to because other people have fixed the problem. How have they fixed the problem? So we need to have, we want to detect, let's say, in our trial, a one-third reduction in the rate of HIV transmission by virtue of the vaginal microbicide. I would love to be able to show that we can reduce transmission from 24% to 16%. Okay, that's, that's the objective. That means I have to randomize 750 women to the microbicide and 750 women to the control. But I'm going to have 25% missing data. That's, it's just sort of, if I take convenience approaches and conveniently follow the women who are willing to come back and are using it all, I'm going to lose 25% of my people. Well, pick up protocols, folks. Statisticians have fixed the problem. Once again, Fleming is excited about something that's already fixed by everybody else. Pick up a protocol and see what it says. It says, we're inflating the sample size by whatever to, a, to account for missingness. 
So if there's 25% missing and I needed 750 against 750, I'll put a th I'll do I'll, I'll, I'll do one third more. That's a thousand and a thousand. Then when there's 25% missing, I get 750, 750. Oh, look at that, Fleming. It worked out. It wasn't a problem. You just do a 2,000 person trial, 1,000 per arm, 25% missing. I got my 750 against 750. So what's the worry here? Well, by doing what almost every protocol does, did I fix the variability that's induced by missingness? Yeah, I did. I got 750 per arm by that fix. Did I get rid of the bias induced by missingness? No, I did absolutely nothing about the bias. I simply got a more precisely biased estimate. Okay, I, increase, I could increase the sample size to 10,000 people. And I'll have an incredibly precise estimate around something not close to the truth. That's what we do. Read your protocols, folks. And I'm, I'm, I'm a statistician, so I'm taking the blame. Statisticians do this. We write the protocols to say, and by the way, it's bad when you do it. Why? Because you're telling caregivers who use the protocol that it's not a problem, that missing data. The statisticians already factored that in. They fixed it. No, I would rather leave the sample size alone and let them know we didn't fix the problem because we didn't fix it. Or if you really want to increase the sample size, say it's for a different reason. We could always increase our sample size. It's not hard. You know, there's many reasons you can, you can just you know, change the numbers easily and <coughs> increase your sample size. Don't ever tell us you're doing it because you're addressing missingness, because you're not. There's lack of of clarity about performance standards. Let me give an example of this, and, and it's, ni it's nicest to give this example in HIV, in, in, in prevention trials, in large cardiovascular safety trials. I'm the chair of this monitoring committee. This is a trial that's actually been going on for about seven, eight years. It's a landmark trial. If you follow rheumatoid, if you, if you follow um, osteoporosis, rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis settings, what you know is pain relievers are really integral. Naproxen, ibuprofen, NSAIDs, but COX-2 but, but COX inhibitors provide a mechanism to provide pain relief without GI ulceration. The problem is Vioxx and Bextra in so doing increase the death stroke MI rate by 50% uh, from 10 events per thousand person years to 15. That's a huge increase. Celecoxib was left on the market as the only COX-2 inhibitor that wasn't known whether it increased this rate. And so this trial is a study being done in OARA patients to determine whether or not the COX-2 inhibitor is, has an excess rate of death stroke MI compared to the classic NSAIDs, ibuprofen and naproxen. Next year, we will be releasing this result in 25,000 people, and it will be a very significant contribution to the insights about what you should use for pain relief. Uh, th the issue is, in trials like this, noise biases you toward no difference. And it would be a disaster if celecoxib increases your death stroke MI rate from 10 events to 15 events per thousand person years if we missed it because of noise. What kinds of noise? Well, we, we didn't get a large enough sample size or a high enough event rate or the people that were on celecoxib weren't adherent to it or the people that were on the controls of ibuprofen and naproxen crossed into celecoxib. All those noises decrease your sensitivity to true differences or missing data. So the point to this example, because it also applies to us in HIV, is we need to pre-specify those performance areas that impact the interpretability of our data. This can't be a passive approach. It has to be an active approach where in the protocol we pre-specify what we have to do and then we put aggressive strategies in to achieve it. And this aggressive strategy is to achieve it. We have a marvelous example of how this was done in HIV. And I published this article in Annals of Internal Medicine on Missing Data in 2011 using HPTN's example of how, how to do this. So to teaching the world in all disease areas how to actually proactively achieve high levels of capture by using an HPTN example in the Annals of Internal Medicine. Here was the example. 
as all of you know, this landmark trial 012 was basically saying, yeah, we knew, I was on the data monitoring committee for ACDG 076 in 1993 when we stopped the trial because we had a 30 to 40% reduction in, in fact, it was a 65% reduction in mother-to-child transmission using AZT uh, during second and third trimesters of pregnancy, during labor and delivery intensively with IV administration and to the, to the uh, infant for six weeks thereafter. The problem was to deliver that or to deliver, in fact, triple drug therapy, which by 1997 had emerged as a standard, reduced transmission rates by 99%. I mean, we could reduce transmission rates from 25% to 1%. And yet, in developing country settings, it was unavailable. So the, the terrible inequity of all of this was you had, in developed country settings, where one in a thousand pregnant women were infected, we could reduce their risk of transmission to one in a hundred. One in a hundred, one in a thousand is one per hundred thousand. One per hundred thousand. While in developing country settings, we had 10% of infants being born with HIV. 10,000 per 100,000, we were doing nothing about it. So we were masterfully preventing what wasn't happening and not doing anything in where it was happening. Why? Because triple drug therapy was, was more than $1,000 per mother-infant pair per capita. The annual per capita healthcare budget was about seven bucks. We didn't have the will, socially, politically, whatever, to do the right thing. And so the idea here in 1997 was what was feasible to be done in developing country settings. It was in Kampala, Uganda that we did the trial. Well, a single oral dose of nevirapine to the mom at labor and delivery and a single oral dose to her infant was remarkably convenient, very feasible, very affordable, but <coughs> would it work? And so this was the objective of 012 to find out if it would sub substantially reduce transmission rate in a strategy that was feasible and available in this setting. And I remember traveling to Kampala, Uganda, and we were planning the trial. And I remember talking to people here and to others across the HIVNET network, that was the parent network, as you know, for HPTN and HVTN. We started back as HIVNET back in 1993 and eventually grew to our offspring of BTN and PTN, and those offspring eventually was MTN and others. But that was our, our, we were all HIVNET at that time. And I remember talking to people in HIVNET uh, back in the mid-90s saying, we have to reduce missingness. We have to have high retention in order to have results be interpretable. And they said, what do you mean? I said, we have to follow these infants for 18 months after birth because what happens to them of what value is it to prevent transmission antenatally if in fact they become infected during breastfeeding? We want to get them through the risk if their mother's infected. And they said, what do you mean? How, what do you want to do? And I said, we have to follow at least 95%. And they said to me, <laughs> I had come from Mayo Clinic. They said, Fleming, you're not Mayo Clinic anymore. This isn't a cancer trial at Mayo Clinic where you have a captured population and you say come back and they come back. They said, these are mother-infant pairs with no home address who are coming walking down into Old Malago Hospital, into Kampala, Uganda, to Old Malago Hospital. And you're telling me you want to follow 95 plus percent of those infants for 18 months after birth? They said, it's not going to happen. And I said, you know, you're, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. I'm not a Mayo Clinic. This is far harder. This is far harder to achieve that. But you know what? The fact that it's harder doesn't make it any less bias-inducing. The fact that it's hard to follow these infants doesn't mean that when you don't, it induces less bias than when you're not following a patient at Mayo Clinic. It's the same bias. And I remember one, thing I, one of the things I remember from one of my mentors now, I can't believe it's 40 years, I think I was in kindergarten, 40 years ago when I started doing medical research, this person said, if something's worth doing, it's worth doing right. You know, if we can't do this right, we shouldn't do it. And doing it right, in fact, means doing it in a way that's interpretable. And heavens knows we needed to do this. 
because we were preventing mother-to-child transmission in developed country settings where it almost never happened and we were doing nothing about it. When we screened mothers to join into this as mother-infant pairs, we weren't going to select high-risk groups. We were going to care clinics and we were finding out that in those settings, a third of these women were already infected, even though they were monogamous. Their partners weren't. And a third of their infants were then going to become infected. A third of a third is one ninth. That means 10% of all these kids were being born with HIV. So we had to do it, and therefore we had to do it right. Well, what they did was incredible. Anytime somebody tells you it can't be done, it's, you know, no. It just means that we have to work harder. And, and, and this is what they did. The, 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 the researchers at Old Malago Hospital were just incredible. They developed this group of health visitors. And these were public health midwives, nurses, that were trained as social workers and educators and home visitors. And every participant was assigned a health, a health visitor. Each, there were, each health visitor had a number of participants, and, and every one participant had a specific relationship with a health visitor. And they developed a rapport with them. These mothers knew that we cared about them. We cared about their well-being. We didn't just care about the research and getting the answer to help society at large. We cared about them personally. And locator information was, was provided. So in essence, what was done in these two areas in terms of caring about them is that they were assured about their confidentiality. There were home visits made if that was acceptable to the mothers, where information on how to contact them was obtained without being passive. We were being active proactive in reaching out to find out what we would need to know to find them. Uh, education was provided. There were there, there's malaria therapies and other things to help these mothers in a health care manner that didn't, in fact, alter the insights that we were going to get as to whether single-dose nevirapine impacted mother-to-child transmission. And, and, in, and in essence, customer, customer care principles were followed. And then in terms of getting retention data, as I said, home visits were, were done if they were allowed. They recorded everything in a very meticulous manner, and then they shared their insights. There were periodic meetings that were held by Professor Miro, Laura Gay, uh, uh, Janita Nankia, Nankia and, and their colleagues, had a very proactive, interactive approach here to uh, sharing insights about how to achieve retention and continued participation of these mother-infant pairs. So what happened? What was the result? Here was the result of the trial. And I still, it's still stunning to me. It's just an amazingly important outcome. Single oral dose. I don't have to follow you in the second and third trimester when I can't follow you anyway and treat you during that time period. If, I can, if we can just reach out to you at labor and delivery and give you a single, or not even an IV injection, a single oral dose and your infant a single oral dose by day one. That reduced transmission by almost 50%. And, and I, while I sound a little critical of pharmaceutical companies from time to time, let me kudos to Beringer Ingelheim, who in fact then made it free. So it would have been four bucks. It wouldn't have been a thousand, it would have been four, but even the four bucks they made available for free. So it became a free intervention. But wait a minute, wait a minute. We were reducing transmission. We were preventing eight infants per hundred from having a, a morbid, life-threatening infection. That's stunning. Number need to treat of 12. You prevented eight deaths per 100 people. Tell me how often you do that in medical research. Yet, we're gonna have 20% missing, right? So this result could be bogus because there are 20% missing, except we were told there would be unavoidable 20% missing they proved that what you're told isn't always true. <laughs> At a key endpoint of three to, three to four months, less than 3% were missing. Even out at 18 months, 4.5% were missing. This was, this was, we were told, you cannot do this. You will have at least 20% missing. We were, we were emphatically told that was the truth, 4%. And that mattered profoundly because this result changed our political will, social will, and research insight about antiretrovirals in developing country settings, that we could do this in a way that would make a difference. And the reliability of that result was heavily dependent on that missingness. 
So why is that? Because data that are missing are not at random. There are strong mechanisms that induce dependent censoring. So I'm sorry about this, guys. You're my missing ones again. When you guys are missing and you aren't, fine. We have your covariates. We will compare you not to all the rest. We'll compare you to those that are like you in covariates. That's logical. That's called imputation. That's a smarter way to handle missingness than the, than the mindless ways of LOCF, complete case, and worst case. Because complete case assumes you're pseudo-random missing. So complete case means I'm leaving you out. I'm assuming everybody else is just like you. Well, at least let's match you to other people that are like you and what we know. The problem is what makes you different from me based on what's known in recorded covariates is the tip of the iceberg. How much of the iceberg can you see? Not very much. Most is below the waterline. Well, what makes two of us different is below what is known and recorded in almost all cases. So yes, I'll hire a fancy statistician to do an imputation. It's not going to help very much. What's going to help is to prevent the missingness. Let me give an example of this using, again, our vaginal microbicide trial. So you folks are 750 women that have been randomized to the active microbicide. You folks are 750 women that have been randomized to the gel. Okay. People are different. So about 40% of you in both groups are inherently non-adherent people. 60% in both groups are inherently adherent people. Randomization worked. It got me 40% on both sides. It worked. Okay. So over here, you guys are the controls. In the controls, 40% of you front rows are inherently less adherent. 60% of you in the back rows are inherently more adherent. Same thing over here, 40% non-adherent, 60% are adherent. What about infection risk? You guys have about a 35% infection risk. You guys have about a 20%. How can that be? You're all placebos. Well, because the non-adherent people inherently are also non-adherent to other things that matter, like condom use. So you folks over here, 40% transmission risk, and you, uh, 35% you folks back here at 20%. Now, what's the effect of my active microbicide? For you folks over here that are the inherently non-adherent people, you're going to be non-adherent to the microbicide. You're also non-adherent to the condoms. You're going to be like these ones over here. You're going to have approximately a 35% transmission rate. So that's 40% of the 750. So that's 300 people. I've got 450 people left, and you're my whole signal. You're the people who are taking the microbicide. Of those 450 of you, the majority of you, five out of six of you, so 375 of you 450, are going to be able to take it, and you're going to tolerate it, you're going to adhere to it, and you're going to benefit from it. Your transmission rate's going to be reduced by a relative 60% from 20 to 8. So the 375 of the 450 of you will have a reduced transmission rate from 20% to 8%. But 75 of you, one-sixth of you, are going to have epithelial disruption that actually is going to have an off-target effect that's going to increase your transmission rate hugely. And if you think this is all hypothetical, I was the DMC chair for the non-oxanol-9 trials, which was maybe the first generation microbicide studies done 15, 20 years ago. And we had negative results in the wrong direction. We were giving this at too high a dose, too high a concentration. We were inducing epithelial disruption. And the and the non oxanol line participants were worse than the controls. So this isn't hypothetical. So with this net effect, what is the overall net effect? No difference. Truth is, with this particular microbicide that's not adhered to in 40%, that's adhered to in 60, but in that 450 that adhere to it, where five out of six get major benefit, but one out of six has epithelial disruption with increased risk, the net effect is no difference. That's the truth. All right, what do we actually see in the data? What we actually see in the data is not that, because we don't follow everybody. What, what do we do in terms of follow-up? Our follow-up is dependent on what's convenient. So you folks over here in the control arm, you folks who are inherently non-adherent, you tend to be harder to follow, too. You tend not to come back so much. So I'm supposed to get two years of follow-up. I get about half of that for you. For those of you who are inherently more adherent, in this case to the gel, we're getting pretty complete follow. Five out of six of you are giving us the full two years of follow, about one out of six of you 
drop out early. So we are missing in total about 25% of the follow-up is missing in the control arm. What about those of you that are on the active microbicide? Okay, again, you folks here that are, sorry, we'll make you the, the good people next time. So of you folks here who are non adherent you're not followed so readily either. We're getting about half of your follow-up. But you folks here that are adherent, you know, you, you're the people who play according to the rules, okay? You're gonna come back, you're gonna be adherent, you're gonna come back, you're gonna be followed. Well, not entirely. Mostly, you're gonna be followed when things are going well. But if you have epithelial disruption, we're gonna stop that microbicide right away. Is that right? Absolutely it's right. You absolutely stop it right away. The mistake is, someone wrote the protocol saying that you're off study when you stop therapy for toxicity. No, they should have said you're off study treatment. You're still being followed. So we stop following you too. And so what are the consequences of that? By the way, this is a great illustration of the kinds of missingness. This is the earlier slide. What are the mechanisms that lead to missingness? There are many. Some of them are off-target effects, some are willingness to participate, and some are inherent frailty. Well, there you go. S missingness because of off-target effects, missingness because of participant willingness, and missingness because of inherent frailty. But different reasons for missingness induce different kinds of risks of bias. So what is the actual result that we see? We designed this trial with 750 women on the active and 750 women on the control for purposes of detecting with high power a one-third reduction in transmission rate from 24% to 16. That was the goal of the trial by design. What do we actually estimate in this setting? Well, by the way, we have pretty comparable missingness in both arms, 25 and 30%. What do we actually estimate because of the 25%? Well, the 25% that are missing, you're missing more of the people at high risk than the people at low risk. So you're going to therefore underestimate this true 26. You're going to underestimate it a bit, and you do. Your estimate's going to be 24% by virtue of the fact that you're missing more of the high risk people than the low risk people. What about in the active arm? You're completely missing the people in whom you've, you've induced epithelial disruption. And so you're radically underestimating their rate, and you get 15.7. And you're feeling pretty good. <laughs> this is cool. And yet, OK, wait a minute, it's not cool. We know the truth is 26 against 26, so it's not cool. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's not what you see. You don't see all of this. This is all you see. So. You designed the trial to detect a 24 versus 16% difference, and you saw it. That's exactly what you saw. And you're really excited until somebody irritating, like Fleming comes along and says in an irritating sounding way, well, you had 25 to 30% missing data, so this is not impressive. And you counter and say, but the p-value is 0, 0, 1. And this is exactly the effect size that we were trying to detect. And by the way, the missingness is balanced. I hear that all the time. But the missingness is balanced. We have a similar percent. So it's a great p-value. It's exactly the difference that we were expecting to get. And the missingness is balanced. Yeah, well, similar percentages of missing data doesn't mean that the missingness is truly of similar nature to what's happening. So the truth in this case is no difference. This marvelous result that you're getting is entirely due to informative missingness. By the way, why do I get excited about this? Have you seen anywhere else on any other slide in this presentation over the last 45 minutes, have you seen those numbers 24 against 15.7? Is there any other setting where those same numbers showed up? I've got till five. <laughs> so. Have you seen any slides in the, last, hint, in the last 10 slides I've shown? Are there any other slides that show a difference in HIV transmission rate of about 24 against 15.7? Like 
What? The O one two. The O one two trial. The O one two trial. These numbers. The O one two trial. Aren't those the exact numbers in the O one two trial? So if you got this result in the O one two trial in the way they told me was absolutely unavoidable in 1995. It was going to happen with at least 20% missing data. Then you tell me if that's the result you got, how you know whether or not that's reliable evidence of a reduction. Because I can tell you, I can get that same exact reduction with 25% missing data when the truth is no difference. So, Preventing missing data is of profound importance. And the fact, and what, what Kampala Uganda did, I give them the credit, they were the ones. What the investigators at Kampala Uganda did at Omalago Hospital with their health workers was stunning. And the importance of that in terms of providing a reliable conclusion, it was absolutely integral to being able to interpret those results. So in summary, We've got to, we, we at least have to tell people in the protocols that when you stop randomized treatment, you don't stop follow-up. You cannot have one section in your protocol that says reasons for off-study, all of which are typically reasons for off-study treatment. There should be in bold letters, off-study treatment. Give all those 17 reasons and then a bold paragraph. All of these people should continue to be followed for outcome per protocol. Then a section calling off study, and it's short. Withdrawal of consent, death. Where withdrawal of consent is explained to not be, I want to stop randomized treatment. It's, I am by my own accord saying, I don't even want you to be able to follow me. And that should be a rare event. And to, and to ensure it is a rare event, it needs to be proactively followed. The informed consent needs to be enlightening people to empower them to make a choice about whether they are lost to follow-up. We should not make sample size calculations that are bogus anyway that adjust for missingness. We should, investigate, we, should, we should find out whether investigators are in. We should only be engaging investigators who are committed to following people until they withdraw consent or die that we will follow them even after they stop randomized intervention. We will follow them even if they start other randomized and other therapies. If somebody starts another therapy, write it down. So if you, in discontinuing the microbicide, choose to start antiretrovirals, fine. That's a good thing. I'm glad you're doing it. I'll write it down. You're still on my trial. It still counts. And an HIV AIDS trial, if I give you an intervention when you have a hematologic malignancy that bridges you to what people around the hutch here do, which is pioneering work on bone marrow transplants or transplants, you get credit for that. If your intervention empowers them to be able to be eligible for other effective supportive care, that's part of the strategy benefit that you get credit for. Everything counts. Then we need to pre-specify the standards we need to, so this is the proactive. You first have to say what it is you're trying to do. Then, like in Kampala, Uganda, you have to have aggressive strategies to achieve it. And then you have to monitor. And the monitoring isn't just the data monitoring. The data monitoring committee is wonderful. I wish we had two more hours to talk about DMCs. DMCs get sole access to information on efficacy and safety. This isn't efficacy and safety. This is quality of study conduct. What's your enrollment rate? What's your adherence rate? What's your retention rate? Everybody gets access to that in pooled data. And so in HPTN, we formed what are called study monitoring committees. You wonder, what's a study monitoring committee? It's us. It's not the PIs for the trial, but it's the rest of us forming an independent oversight group, semi-independent, because we're part of U2. We're part of the PTN. We're not the DMC. We see nothing on efficacy and safety. We see the pooled data on quality of study conduct. And our goal is to proactively see how we're doing on retention how we're doing on the fraction of people who are called withdrawal of consent. Because we're not going to do as well as we should. It's inevitable. We're not going to do as well as we should, even if our protocols are great. We've got to jump in, and we've got to proactively make the right thing happen, just like the healthcare workers did in the 012 trial. 
By the way, again, there are fixes to this. You know, it's really hard to follow those infants for 18 months. Let's define the primary endpoint a week after labor and delivery. That's easier. You know, Fleming doesn't like missing data, and a lot of our infants are being lost in the period from one week post-birth to 18 months. So let's make the primary endpoint, is there a difference in transmission risk a month or a day or a week after delivery? That's easier. But it's not the right answer if an infection that occurs is a bad thing, whether it occurs during labor and delivery or during breastfeeding. It's like saying in, in severe sepsis. I've worked with people for a long time in trying to find, we've not been successful. We have nothing that's been successful. We thought Zygris was, but it wasn't. We have no effective therapy for severe sepsis that causes mortality in 30% of patients at 28 days. So somebody said, well, let's do a time to event analysis, not just the fraction of people who are dead at day 30. Let's look and see at least if we delay death. I said, delaying death in a chronic setting like breast cancer, that matters. If you would have died at month six, you die at month 18, that matters. Of what value is it to take somebody who would have died at day, eight, at, at day six in intensive care and keep them alive to day 18? I don't think that's the goal. I don't, the goal isn't in a, an acute risk setting for an irreversible morbidity and mortality outcome to keep a person around a little longer before they die. To keep a breast cancer person, a woman, around for a year longer is an important thing. Time to event analysis is the right answer. It's not just whether you die, it's how long it takes. But in an acute setting, it's not how long it takes, it's whether. If you die at day six, it might actually be even better than dying at day 18 because you're going to be 12 less days in misery and intensive care before you died. Well, similarly for these kids, the goal is to keep them HIV infection free until the risk of mother to child is over. So no, you don't fix the problem by changing the endpoint to something that isn't clinically relevant. Of course, we can fix the problem in the, in the microbicide setting. We can fix that problem by saying, you know, I know Fleming, you wanted the endpoint preventing HIV infection in these women. But how about, because you're worried about them discontinuing, if they discontinue, we'll count that as a failure too. People propose this. <laughs> I'm not making this up. The end point's going to be preventing the composite of a failure, which is either HIV infection for the woman or that she discontinues the microbicide. Then there's no missing data because the women who discontinue are an event, hence they're not missing. You're right. You defined away missingness. And the endpoint analysis is no longer what women care about, which is preventing HIV infection. It's if you take this microbicide formulated in this way, you're able to take it longer. Well, doc, does it matter? I don't know. That wasn't the endpoint. The endpoint was discontinuation versus HIV infection, where most events were discontinuation events. Well, that's ridiculous. That's not what we wanted to find out. So we don't fix this problem by changing the endpoint. Bottom line is statisticians can use smart methods. It's better to do that than to simply count you as pseudo-random missing. So we'll look and see your covariates, and we're going to match you up to somebody who's being followed. The problem, as we say, though, tip of the iceberg. So yes, I'm all for imputation methods, but they're, they're weak in terms of fixing the problem. The problem has got to be prevention. Um, and I love this, and I love this in all, I love this in a disease setting, I love it in a science setting. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Uh, there was no way we were going to fix the 012 data if they hadn't, in the beginning, fixed it the right way by putting the healthcare workers in there to prevent the missingness. So we are probably at a time that if we break now for five minutes, we will finish at one, because this last segment we can do in, in max an hour. So why don't we do it? Let's take a break for five minutes. We'll reconvene at noon, and we'll talk about what to do when you're not, when you're not randomizing against a placebo.
We'll finish up with the last of your four lectures. You know, like the best thing to do maybe is use. Um, just again, for folks who might be following at home, um, we are on the last of our four lectures, uh, key considerations in non-inferiority trials, uh, prep and microbicide studies. If you are just joining us and haven't done so already, uh, if you're joining us online, please do email Nakia Fraser. Her email address is up on the screen. Um, and let us know that you are attending and provide your name, organization, and role. We will uh, potentially send you a four gigabyte flash drive uh, as a thank you if you win our mini sweepstakes. Uh, without further ado, Dr. Fleming. Great. So, just to lead into this last topic here, which is um, looking at, in a specific sense, um, PrEP studies and microbicide studies, but more broadly, studies where we might be designing to compare not against a placebo but against an active control standard of care. So kind of preaching to the choir here, what's a motivating context? Uh, we know with HIV prevention that we have many approaches that could in fact be effective. We talked a lot in the last presentation about microbicides and they are an option that has considerable interest in em empowering women in particular. But we know from data, and we'll talk about this, that a major feature that is complicating the effectiveness of a microbicide is adherence. It's, it's, in contrast, a vaccine, if we have one, has a huge benefit that you can vaccinate someone once or infrequently and induce an immune response that we hope will be durable and you know, there's not this adherence issue where you have to be revaccinated every time you're going to have risk behaviors. Um, and it should be, we hope, effective and safe and low cost. Um, we just don't have it yet. But I still consider it a, a major objective because of those other critical features it has. What we do have that has been marvelously successful is use of antiretrovirals. We know marvelously successful in treating HIV-infected people. It's not curative but it does render an acute fatal disease to one that can often be managed as a long-term chronic disease. But what we're learning is that a potentially even greater benefit of antiretrovirals is their prevention effects. That we've, we've learned that mother-to-child transmission can be almost eliminated by effective antiretrovirals that suppress viral load to undetectable levels. And we now know from HBTN052 that that result extrapolates much more broadly to all settings, including heterosexual transmission of HIV, that if we simply have the political and social will to identify and treat infected people, that not only is it going to benefit them, but it's going to hugely benefit society as a whole by reducing the spread. And to me, we're going to beat this through prevention. We're going to beat this by identifying collective integrated strategies for prevention that lead to reducing the level of spread to a level where it will become largely controlled. Um, so one of the ways that we have had successes, as we said, is with antiretrovirals. And what it does is it creates this concept of treatment for prevention. <clears throat> and so if we could find and treat everybody who's infected, that, you might say, could largely solve the problem. But then reality hits. And even knowing that treating HIV reduces the risk of the infected person infecting another, if you are someone engaged in high-risk activities, you can't be certain or even necessarily confident that the partners you will have will, in fact, if they're infected, be taking treatment. Maybe they don't know they're infected. And, and so we need more, even with the marvelous achievements of treatment for prevention, we need other strategies. And one of those strategies, it seems to me to be really nicely complementary to treating the infected in order to reduce their infectiousness, is to also then empower the uninfected to be at less risk of transmission in the event that the person with whom they have interactions themselves are still infectious. And uh, FDC, F, uh, TDF, FTC, that I will call Truvada, 
for short, has been a, a principal, well-studied uh, antiretroviral strategy that has yielded some quite diverse levels of evidence of large levels of reduction, 75%, maybe 63%, down to essentially no reduction, all across different placebo-controlled trials, where there is some evidence to say that that level of reduction depends on levels of adherence. Now, what hugely bothers me are invalid analyses about how adherence impacts efficacy. These are valid analyses. These analyses are basically saying, you're randomized to the active, you're randomized to the control. We will, in fact, document what is the overall average level of adherence within the strategy. It was 80% in partners prep that was conducted in Uganda and Kenya. It was 29 to 35% in South Africa in the voice trial in FEMPREP. Okay, those are not person-specific adherence numbers. That's the average adherence of the strategy. As the average adherence of the strategy went up, the efficacy went up. That's a valid inference, validly to say that's the evidence that higher levels of adherence are in fact causal. What's invalid is to say the three of you who were adherent had a lower transmission rate than those three of you who weren't adherent. And I see those analyses all the time. Those are bogus analyses. The three of you that are adherent aren't like the three of you that weren't. Therefore, the difference between you isn't just the microbicide that you got when you were adherent. You probably were taking, you probably, I don't know this, but readily, you were taking low risk, you were taking high risk. You maybe were using condoms and you weren't. So there's no causal data at all. But you look at this in the literature, and we see it all, why do, we, why do we see it? Because we get much better estimates. We don't like estimates like this. We like estimates like this. So even in a trial that gives an estimate of 20%, you can make it look like 90%, because those that weren't adherent had tenfold the transmission risk than those that were. That doesn't tell me in any way whether the adherence was the reason. This, however, does, because this is looking at the overall adherence of the strategy against its efficacy. Okay, so this is what we see with Truvada. We know that we have further to go, because we haven't figured out yet how to get this instead of this. But even more problematic, you might say, is we have had marvelous successes with antiretrovirals, with triple drug therapy for treatment. And we know that's really important because we started off this discussion by saying we've taken an acute fatal setting and made it chronic. And even more importantly, I think, we've prevented transmission almost completely by when we can find you and treat you by treating you. And Travada is a mainstay integral component of triple drug therapy. So I actually argue Yes, I want effective PrEP, but not at the expense of effective primary treatment for infected. And so I'd rather build, and, I, and there's arguments about this. People say, don't worry, Fleming, don't worry. We can widely use Travada in a much less consistent way, which worries me about resistance when I do that, in a uninfected population, and it's not going to induce an increased risk of, of uh, resistance to Travada in the treatment setting. But I worry about that. So that gives us context for where we are in PrEP. There are legitimate interests, even with the successes to date that we've had in studies like, like the uh, Partners PrEP trial and the Botswana CDC trial, that we want other oral daily drugs. We want long-acting formulations. This makes total sense so that we can treat you much less frequently and give you a much more steady level of protection. And new dosing strategies. Maybe we should be a little more, instead of treating you every day, we'll treat you when you consider yourself to be at risk, quietly dependent. And effectively then, our strategies, and Deborah Donnell nicely laid this out quite a while ago in a paper, can be thought of as we want to look at the columns here, a new oral drug like Moravarok instead of Truvada or 
a longer acting injectable or a new way of dosing Truvada. And then settings. This bottom setting is, let's say, a setting where we're very poor at getting adherence. If you're very poor at getting adherence, then placebo is still the center of care. Truvada isn't the center of care in a setting where we can't get adherence to Truvada. Then a trial could be a superiority placebo control trial. In fact, we don't have to talk about those now because we know how to analyze superiority placebo control trials. Or maybe a placebo add-on trial. The goal in this setting is to say, Travada is pretty good, but we have a complementary mechanism of action with this new drug, and we want to give it in combination with Travada instead of Travada. And that doesn't get Travada out of the dual role of PrEP and treatment, but it enhances the effect in PrEP. The setting I want to talk about is where I'm replacing it. I'm actually going to, I, it's a setting where Truvada really works. So I have to give it as the control. I can't be a placebo control. I have to give it as the control. It really works. But I want to replace it. And that's the setting that we're going to talk about here. So again, why would I want to do that when it really works? Well, maybe Maravarak works even better. Maybe it has better penetration of rectal tissues, and it will give an even better result. Or a long-acting version can give an even, even a better result because we get better adherence with this than we do with Travada. But I also, even if it's similar efficacy, if, if Maravarak is similar to Travada, I like it because it gets me out of the range of having to use Travada both for treatment, for treatment as prevention, and for PrEP. And so all of this motivates, then, doing trials that will, exper that will look at an experimental, like I'll use as an example in this presentation, Moravarok. I want to study Moravarok relative to Travada in a setting where Travada really works, so I can't use placebo. It's unethical to use placebo in a setting of participants like those that were in discordant partners in partners prep. I, it's, it's unethical to do a placebo controlled trial of Moravarok. It's also not relevant scientifically. I know how to largely but not fully prevent. So I want to go up against Truvada uh, with Moravarok. But, and I'd be happy if I could show it was the same. Because if Moravarok is just the same as Truvada, now I have another, another critical arrow in my arsenal here, and I can, save more, I can save Travada for the treatment setting. But you can't prove, you can never prove two treatments are the same. That would take an infinite sample size. So in essence, then, we have to prove they're similar. Well, rigorously, how do you prove similar? You prove they're similar by ruling out that they're unacceptably worse. So for example, if we have 75% efficacy, so you reduce transmission rate by 75% in a partner's prep scenario, but it's with Travada. Let's say if I could have at least 65% reduction, I'm within 10%. If I could rule out that I'm 10% worse, then I will count that similar. Okay, that's how we rigorously do it. That's called, the 10% is called the margin. The margin is the amount that I will allow it to be worse and still called clinically similar. And so the art of this kind of trial, since you can never prove Moravarok is the same, you can only, in essence, in a crude sense, establish it similar by ruling out it's unacceptably worse. The art here is to define what that margin is. Now, there's a tension here. If, in a partner's prep setting, if Travada has 75% efficacy, and we're trying to rule out that we're 10% worse, that's going to take a really big trial. If we could only rule out that it's 20% worse, that would take one quarter the trial size. Plus, you're much more likely to be able to rule out your 20% worse than 10% worse. And we all like positive trials, right? We started with that four hours ago, four hours and 18 minutes ago. We talked about how people want positive results. So there's a strong, strong inclination when you're doing this kind of, we call it non-inferiority trials, to choose big margins. Because it's much more likely that you can rule out you're a whole lot worse than to rule out you're only a little bit worse. 
you're much more likely to do so. And you can be far smaller. You don't need a 10,000 person trial, you need a 2,000 person trial. Well, the problem is it's bogus if you're ruling out your 20% worse when participants wouldn't consider it to be acceptable to be 12% worse. Of what value is it to rule out your hugely worse when being moderately worse is unacceptable? So fundamentally, this margin has to be small enough that you can argue that when you rule it out, you can conclude that you truly are clinically comparable. It has to be small enough that anything that is that large or smaller is an acceptable loss. And, and therein lies the tension between wanting to have scientific rigor with smaller margins, but wanting to get a positive result and wanting to do it with a smaller trial size, which in fact is leading people inappropriately to having margins that are too big. Well, one of the fundamental problems, if we're studying Moravarok against Truvada and the results look similar, one of the fundamental problems that we always encounter is, okay, so you put 5,000 people on Moravarok and 5,000 people on Truvada and you follow them forward and you have 200 infections and you have 200 infections. Okay, that's similar, right? you have a similar transmission risk of about 4% in both groups. Is that similarly effective or similarly ineffective? I only know it's similar. You say, well, it's easy Fleming. It's similarly effective. How do you know that? Because Travada is so effective. <laughs> Tell me how I know Travada is effective in this trial, in the way people were managed, in the levels of adherence that were achieved in this trial, in the kind of supportive care they got, at the levels of risk behavior, and in the ways we assessed endpoints. And so the fundamental missing aspect here is when you're comparing Moravarok to Travada, there is no third arm that's a placebo, nor can there be. It's not ethical to randomize these people that we know will be adherent and will get a good result on Travada to a placebo. So I still want to know what Moravarok is doing. I don't want to just know it's similar if, in fact, being similar is similar to something that's ineffective. And so, in essence, I need to know this chain, too. If I know, and this is valuable, to know how Moravarok head-to-head -head is against Travada, but to know how it is against placebo, I have to know what Travada did against placebo in this trial setting. And this leads to the three criteria that I need to do a valid non-inferiority trial. To be able to use a non-placebo control, to be able to use an active comparator like Travada as my control arm, that active compared to Travada has to itself be highly effective, where that's precisely estimated. And here's the critical point, where those estimates of the effect of Travada that aren't coming from my Moravarok trial, coming from other trials, where those estimates of the active comparator Travada's effect from the other trials are relevant to the Moravarok non-inferiority trial. And this is called the constancy assumption. So if you read the literature in non-inferiority, you're going to hear people talking about, does the constancy assumption hold? And it's critical because to conclude, to go back one slide, to conclude that when Moravarok is similar to Travada, that that means similarly effective instead of similarly ineffective, you have to know how Travada is acting in our trial. You have historical trials telling you how Travada works. You have the partner's prep trial telling you Travada had a 75% reduction. I want to know whether that estimate applies to my Moravarok trial. And that's the constant assumption. Well, you'd say, well, again, Fleming, come on, you make issues that are so easily solved. Um, we just look and make sure they were done the same. But there's lots of ways that the original uh, partner's prep trial in its assessment of Travada's effect could differ from how my Moravarok trial is done. I could have different characteristics of people, different supportive care. By the way, these are huge issues for antibiotic development. Sadly, sadly, I say, almost all antibiotics are developed in non-inferiority trials. 
So in pneumonia, you have a new antibiotic in pneumonia. How do you assess its effect? You randomize against piperacillin tazobactam, a, a, a penicillin derivative. And then you show you have the same survival. And I say, well, how do I know that your new antibiotic is effective? Well, it's the same as piptazo. How do you know piptazo is effective? Because the original trials of piptazo showed it was highly effective. Wait a minute. The original trials of piptazo were done when patients didn't have resistance. So before antibiotic resistance developed, penicillin was really great. Don't show me how good a penicillin derivative is in a modern day trial. Don't tell me that a new antibiotic against piptazo is similar, hence similarly effective, because I know penicillin derivatives are really effective because look, when they were studied 30 years ago, they had a great result against placebo. Yeah, that was before resistance. Yes. So if, but if, that, if the comparator, the original drug, is still being used in clinical treatment, yes. is there a presumption that it's still effective? I mean, if it is, well, if, it is the if that care, presumption is it's still effective, it's based on the fact that it's still, by any evidence I have, as good as any other option I have. But you're going to hear in the antibiotics world people crying out about the fact that it's not still effective. And that's why we need to. The, the point is. The arguments, the, 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 the illogic to the argument in antibiotic development today is we have resistance. Well, yeah, we do. Why do we have it? Because you use these antibiotics for acute otitis media. Dummy. They don't do anything there. You, they have profound effect in pneumonia. You should have saved them for pneumonia, except you don't make a lot of money by just saving it for pneumonia. So we all accept that our antibiotics are going down. Well, then if we accept they're going down and we want to improve in people that are resistant, why are you doing non-inferiority in, in people who are not getting a good result? You have to be superior in people who aren't getting a good result. So the logic that people are using is, you know, agents like Piptase are losing their effects. We need to do better. Okay, we need to do better. We should be superiority. Once they're losing their effect, being the same is no longer clearly effective. Okay, so... It's critical if you're using an active comparator that the characteristics of the patients in that trial of, of the historical evidence are similar to the characteristics of patients in your non-inferiority trial. I need to have non-resistant patients in my NI trial if I want to know that being the similar to Piptazo is being effective. And supportive care. People say in an antibiotic trial, you, patients come into what? The emergency room with symptoms of pneumonia. That's how we find them in, in, in community-acquired pneumonia. So what are you going to do? I'm going to get an antibiotic in there right away. If you get an antibiotic in there right away, now you can't randomize against an active comparator because the active comparator is not adding anything to the background antibiotic you gave. Hence, a placebo will look great. So I'm giving you all the clues of how to make an ineffective therapy look good. Just do non-inferiority against an active comparator that used to be good but isn't anymore because of resistance, or is good but it doesn't add anything to background antibiotics that you've already given because you argue that as soon as you see the patient and you diagnose them as pneumonia, you have to give them an antibiotic. And that's not true. That's not true. The guidances say you have to get that antibiotic in there within about 12 to 24 hours. You have plenty of time to screen them for the trial and randomize them to Piptazo against the new antibiotic. So these are all issues that, Im, that radically can erode the validity of the constancy assumption. And in our setting, adherence. So our vaginal microbicides, adherence can radically erode the effect. And, and let, let me give you a crystal clear example. Our studies in PrEP provide a beautiful example of the invalidness of the constancy assumption. So let's, let's talk about this. Let's suppose that you have a new antibiotic, not antibiotic, you have a new microbicide, a new vaginal microbicide that you want to study now in the setting of FemPrep, which are heterosexual women. Um, the difference in these settings here, why did we get such differences in, in adherence? This was in partners. These were, these were discordant partners that both knew you knew the, the status of your partner. You knew the importance of having this microbicide, and microbicide adherence was high. 
Um, that was in, as I mentioned, Uganda and Kenya. This study, the CDC study, was done in Botswana where there was a high level of behavioral insight, education, encouragement, reinforcement to adhere, and it worked. Whereas these studies were done, fem prep and voice, using what, you know, to defend them, a more standard, much less uh, aggressive strategy in South Africa for adherence, and we got what we got, which was pretty sporadic adherence, and we got much less overall efficacy. So let's suppose you're now doing a trial today of a new microbicide against Truvada. Okay? And by the way, this column is the results in Truvada, and this column is the results in the placebo. So this is the result in Truvada in our trial. And it was. This was the true result in Truvada. Now, in truth, this was the result on placebo. But let's suppose, hypothetically, that this trial, instead of being a placebo-controlled trial that was of Truvada against a placebo, let's say it was Truvada against Maravarak. Okay? So I do Truvada against Maravarak, and I get a similar result. And I'm saying to you, okay, tell me what you think about this. And you say, well, Maravarak was essentially the same in terms of numbers of infections as Truvada. This is cool because now I can give these participants in this setting Maravarak instead of Truvada and save Truvada for the treatment setting. I say, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You say it's cool because you're saying Maravarak is similar to Truvada, but you must know that Truvada is effective. You say, yes, I know it's effective. I say, how do you know it's effective? Well, because we have another trial in a similar setting of heterosexual women where the placebo was three times the rate of transmission of Truvada. So this is the historical trial that's being used as the evidence for the effect of the active comparator Truvada, saying it's highly effective. Therefore, when Maravarak has a similar rate to Truvada, because Truvada is so much better than placebo, it must mean that Maravarak is better than placebo. Well, you guys all know that that's a bogus argument because you actually know that in this setting, this was placebo. And while Truvada was really effective up here, it was completely ineffective here. And therein lies the flaw of the Kansi assumption, is that if we do a trial that has no placebo and randomizes you to the active comparator Truvada and the experimental Maravarak, there is no placebo. And when the results are similar, your only way of knowing whether this is similar ineffective or similar effective is having the Kansi assumption hold for other data. And you know what? It didn't hold here. And so this argument that would have been given, if this, if this actually had been a Maravarak result instead of a Truvada, instead of a placebo result, we'd have been really tempted to use these data and say, this means they're both really effective by providing a 63% reduction. No, they're both highly ineffective, providing a 6% reduction. The Kansi assumption failed. And you know what? You will never, ever provide ironclad evidence that the constant assumption holds. You cannot prove to me that when you do a, Marav a, a Travada against Maravarak trial and you tell me whether or not this is, when it's similar, effective or ineffective, there is no direct proof that the results from other trials about the active comparator apply to this one. Yes? The example you just made up, the 35, or hypothetically Maravarak, would we even also say because we had 35% adherence that we also could really... Yes, you would. Yeah. Okay. So if you, in fact, had a really good biomarker that would be really good clues about what would allow you to extrapolate, you would absolutely use that. But I don't, but in many settings, we don't collect that kind of data. And the quality of that data could be really suspect. Well, I, mean, I, I was thinking it sort of feels like, and this is probably the important distinction, I think, that if you had a really good biomarker, let's say you're using it on Yes. You still end up with, it's, kind of, it's sort of like missing it in, in, the, in the analysis. It's like you've got, um, you don't know that the 
No, you don't. And, and in the end, the adherence data is indirect. It gives me clues, but it's indirect. The direct evidence here is the therapeutic strategy as administered in this setting and what was its relative efficacy. And all we're getting is the relative efficacy against the active comparator. Okay, so how do we proceed? I will show you how we proceed, just so that you know, even though it's not perfect, but it's what we do. So what would you do? And by the way, I don't like non-inferiority. It's one of the areas where when you become an expert in something, you would think you would like what you do. <laughs> I like what I do in clinical trials, and one of the areas I consider myself an expert is non-inferiority, and the more expert I am, the more I don't like it. But we have to do it sometimes. When do we have to do it? We have to do it. I think this is a classic example. You've got to do it if you're in a setting where you believe that you can get high levels of adherence, so the active comparator is highly effective, but you still want to replace it. And I do. I want to get it out of the role of being the principal agent in treatment and the principal agent in prevention. Okay, so what do we do? So let's, let's illustrate this by IPREX. I use it because it's a setting where we have particularly large amount of information. We have 131 events. It's the numbers of events that gives us precision. So here's the setting. Let's suppose we wanted to develop insights about whether Maravara could be used instead of Trivada in men who have sex with men as a PrEP regimen. That's the clinical question that we're trying to solve. And hence, we're going to do a non-inferiority trial, directly comparing the experimental Maravara to the active compared to Trivada. And so how do we do it? Well, the key, as we said, is there's no point in even doing this trial unless the active comparator, remember, is highly effective with precise estimates of efficacy in a setting where constant assumption holds. Okay, that's, those are the criteria. There they are. So is it true that Travada satisfies those properties in this MSM setting? Well, the evidence that we're going to use in our non-inferiority trial for the effect of the active comparator Trivada is going to come from IPREX, which was a placebo-controlled superiority trial of Trivada against placebo. First thing I like about it is 131 events. I mean, that's not wonderful, but it's a whole lot better than I see a lot. You'd be amazed. Just put HIV aside. Think of any other clinical setting. You'd be amazed, even today, when, as much as we support evidence-based medicine, at how little scientific data we have for many interventions that we consider standard of care. And unfortunately, the sad thing about them is when you have very little data on the efficacy of a standard of care, it's really hard to replace it by something else that is similar because you can't do non-inferiority if you don't have precise estimates of the effect of the active comparator. It works the wrong way here. I was saying before how I love something working the right. Here it works the wrong way. You're empowering sponsors who do crummy research to keep market share because if you do crummy research, it's really hard for someone else to replace your market by being similar to you because you can't do non-inferiority. Um, I tell you that because I'm assuming you'll figure it out anyway and that you'll have the integrity to not take the low road. Okay, so this was pretty good, 131 events. It's also pretty effective. You're getting almost a 50% reduction in transmission risk. So in essence, what are we going to do? Everything, everything is against the active comparator. So this is looking at HIV infection rate on any strategy compared to Trivada. Okay, so our, our Maravarak trial is going to tell us, we hope that Maravarak lives over here. It would be wonderful if the HIV infection rate on Maravarak is less than Trivada. Then Maravarak would be over here. If it's equal to Trivada, it's here. And heaven forbid, if it's over here, it's worse. Okay, but fundamentally, wherever it is, and basically we're accepting the fact that it's of interest to us even if it's here. Even if Maravarak lives right around the equal point with Trivada, that's good enough if placebo is way over here. So the fundamental issue is we will conclude that Maravarak is effective if wherever it lives here, it's way to the left of where placebo is. So it creates then this tension, because there is no placebo control in my Maravarak NI trial. The tension is to find out where placebo lives. Okay, If placebo is over here, 
why in the heck am I using Truvada? If placebo's over here, it's actually, Truvada's harmful. If placebo's over here, I still wonder why I'm using Truvada because Truvada is neutral. So pretty much I'm going to presume placebo's over here. That's the reason I'm using Truvada is that it's better than placebo. Placebo has a higher rate of events than, than Truvada. So I got to figure out where that is. I got to be able to plug in where placebo lives. Well, if Truvada has half the rate on placebo, then placebo has what rate compared to Truvada? And it's just simple inversion of math. Come on, we've got some good mathematicians here. So if, 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 if Truvada's rate is half placebo's rate, then placebo's rate is what against Truvada? Twice, exactly, just invert. Right. So I know, I, I know that if Truvada's rate is half placebo's, then by inversion, placebo's rate is 1.72 Truvada's rate. And if Truvada could be as much as 82%, then I invert that, then placebo must be at least 1.22, must be at least 1.22 higher. So therefore, I can now plug in placebo. Placebo resides over here at 72% higher rate of HIV infection compared to Truvada. That could be Placebo could be as bad as two and a half fold higher. That's a really great result for Truvada. Or as little effective as placebo could be only 22% higher, which means that if it's placebo's over here, Truvada's not too effective. Truvada's pretty effective. Truvada's highly effective. The problem is I don't know where it lies. And the, and the biggest problem is this, this isn't really telling me where placebo resides in the Maravarak non priority trial. It's telling me where placebo resided in the IPREX placebo control trial. Okay, and again, the constant assumption may know, I want to know where placebo is in the Moravarok trial. I only know where it is in the IPREX trial. And for all these reasons, the estimate of what placebo is against Truvada, i.e. what Truvada's effect is, could be very different in IPREX than in the Moravarok NI trial. So what's our convention? It's only a convention. It's not rocket science. We're going to say, all right, if we know that placebo lies somewhere from a 22% higher rate to 150% higher rate, we're going to say it's 22. We're going to take the lower limit of the confidence interval. It's called the 95-95 method. You're taking the lower limit of the 95% confidence interval. And you're going to say, I know, you got one more chance to say, Fleming, you are so conservative. You're taking the most limited well, wait a minute. It's not necessarily conservative. This is just based on a confidence interval. It may be that its true effect is over here. Because it may be that in my Moravarok trial, I happen to get participants that aren't remotely as adherent as what was in the, in the IPREX trial. So I'm, I'm, I disagree that I'm being conservative. This is the convention that we use. OK. Now, in essence, what do I know? What I know thus far is if I accept, in a sense, the IPREX trial to tell me how effective Truvada, the active comparator, is, I know that it's effective enough that I estimate the placebo has a 70% higher rate that could be anywhere from 22 to 150% higher. I'm going I'm to take the 22% the, 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 the higher rate because I don't know whether or not constancy holds. These issues could be different for the effect of Truvada in my Moravarok trial from the IPREX trial. And there's one more issue here. If I, in fact, show that Moravarok lives somewhere here with an upper limit that rules out 1.22, then that's evidence that Moravarok is better than placebo because I'm putting placebo here. This is where the green number. This is where I'm putting placebo. This is where I'm saying placebo is. Therefore, now when I do my NI trial, comparing the experimental Moravarok to the active compared to Truvada, I have to have a point estimate and a confidence interval that rules this out. That's why it's called 95-95. I'm going to take the upper limit of the 95% confidence interval for Moravarok against Truvada and show it's less than the 95% lower limit for what I have for placebo against Truvada from the IPREX trial. 95-95, that's what we do. Not quite. Because if I do that, I'm simply ruling out that Moravarox a placebo. Why is it good enough to rule out Moravarox a placebo? It wasn't ethical. Placebo is not an admissible option here. It wasn't ethical 
in a partner's prep setting to use placebo. So once you have an effect, an effective agent like Truvada, I have to preserve part of its effect. And so kind of a simple mathematical naive approach, I got to preserve somewhere between none of the effect and all of the effect. Give me a quantity that's between none and all. Some. Some. Define some. Give me a mathematical number for some. 50%, thank you. That's what we do. If you've got to preserve some, we're going to preserve half. So what's 50%? Well, it's the square root of 1.22 is 1.1. You say, wait a minute, Fleming, wait a minute. It's 22%, half of that's 11. Well, this is on a log scale. Everything's on a log scale. Estimates on a log scale. So half on a log scale is a square root. So therefore, the actual margin that we use is 10%. You have to estimate what Moravarak is against Truvada, where the upper limit of the compositable rules out that it's 10% higher than, than Truvada. If you rule out that its rate of transmission is more than 10% higher, you're then mathematically concluding that these data establish not that Moravarak is equal to Truvada, but that it's preserving at least half of its effect. That's the logical conclusion. Now, is that still good enough? There's still one more consideration here that I have to have. Is it clinically sensible to say patients are okay if the trans HIV transmission rate on a relative scale is up to 10% higher on, on Moravarak than Truvada? Is that clinically acceptable? Well, it depends on what I get in back. What, do you, what, do you get? what are you offering me for that? If I'm a patient, why, why not just use Truvada, right? Why use anything else that could be worse? Well, there are issues about side effects. There are issues around avoiding first line. I'm actually benefited as an uninfected person by using a strategy for prevention that if it fails, I haven't compromised, and others haven't compromised the strategy that I'm going to need for my treatment. OK, I'll buy that. I'll take a little more risk of becoming infected if I have a much better course once I am infected. And that's kind of the philosophy of this. So what's a little better? Well, let's suppose you're entering patients here that have a 2.25 rate of infection per 100 person years. If it's 2.25 per 100 person years, what is 10% more? 10% of 2.25 per 100 is 2.25 per 1,000. And so that's effective. If we're using the margin of 1.1, if we're going back here and using the margin of 1.1, what you're saying is when you rule this out, you're establishing that it is non-inferior. That only has clinical relevance if you tell me everything less than a 10% increase is okay. What is a 10%? It's 2.25 additional infections per 1,000 person years. So that's what clinicians and caregivers have to have accepted here. To use a margin even as little as 1.1, you got to be convinced that it's okay if we use Moravarak to have two more infections per thousand person years than Moravarak would have. It's okay. Why? Because by so doing, when you become infected, you're, you're confident you'll have a more effective therapeutic strategy for treatment. Okay, so 2.25 per thousand is what I'm giving up for this benefit. If you agree with me, then you can justify the 1.1 margin. If you don't agree with me, then we have to use a margin even smaller. By the way, if you make a margin 1.05, the trial will have to be fourfold as large. It's exponential here, so that's the sensitivity. Yes? The bigger, so absolutely as it relates to this number, yes. So the better it is, this white number is further and further here, and the more precise you have, the tighter it is, that lower limit's way out here, okay? And then preserving half that effect is still over here. But it's then, but, but it's why I'm saying there's still one more step. Once you draw that at 1.5 here, Okay, I'm preserving half the effect of this incredibly effective intervention by ruling out I'm 50% higher. But now, wait a minute. Is it clinically relevant to accept? That's why I had to go through that last step. It also has to be clinically relevant. 
we call this M1 and M2. If you read the literature in non-inferiority, this, th this is basically your development of M1, and M2 is basically saying, but is this really clinically acceptable? It's a great point. Okay, so let's actually go to the data. This is, let's say, what you, you, you randomize, and I, I don't want, uh, sorry folks, this is a 6,000 person trial. You know, I know we hear lots of things in HPTN and you've seen a lot of these trials that are done with 1,000. Not when you are, I mean, it's true, when you, if you presume the active comparator is, that, that the experimental is no better than the active comparator and you have to rule out small differences, it takes really big trials. Now, if you presume you're a little better, you can rule out you're a little worse without a huge trial. So 6,400 people will give us the number of events that's key, 258 events. This, so this is hypothetical, but in my illustration, here's a setting where Moravarak, by estimate, is a little better, ruling out that it's a little worse. So where does it look? I can now plug in where Moravarak is. There it is. I can now plug it in. This is where Moravarak lives, and its upper limit here for where it lives is 1.09. This would be a successful trial. So this trial would in fact estimate that we're 13% better and rule out that we're as much as 9% worse and in so doing would preserve at least half the effect in Moravarak and would rule out any level of increase which if real would be clinically relevant according to our logic. Now what if this estimate hadn't been 0.87, it had been 1.0? Then the upper limit would have been 1.22, right? We shift this over. If this point estimate were over here, the confidence interval shifts to here. The upper limit's 1.22. What would the conclusion then be? It would be that by estimate, Moravarak is the same as Truvada, ruling out placebo, but not preserving half the effect. Okay? You'd be estimating it to be the same. You'd be ruling out that it was, in fact, a placebo. It's better than a placebo, but you couldn't conclude that it preserves at least half the effect. So that's the final thought I want to talk about is. Do you really have to do that? Do you really have to preserve half the effect? And do you really have to take the lower limit of the confidence interval? There are two things. Do I really have to take the lower limit of this confidence interval, and then do I have to preserve half the effect? So to review this, the argument is yes, and you have to do both. Doing one isn't good enough, as some people in the literature say. You have to do them both independently. So, let me, let me, so fundamentally, we're saying if you have a new Moravarak therapy, and you're estimating its efficacy because you can't do placebo control by doing head-to-head -head against Truvada. That is a basis for determining this is effective only if the active comparator has reliable evidence of substantial effects where constancy holds. So there are two fundamental adjustments we have to make. One is we're using the wider confidence interval. Why is that? Suppose Moravarak was studied directly against placebo. Suppose you did a superiority trial, but non-randomized. So instead of developing Moravarak in non-inferiority against Truvada in a randomized non-inferiority active control trial, suppose you just did 1,000 people on Moravarak compared to an historical control of people that got nothing, an historical control placebo trial. We'd worry about that. We worry about that because in the absence of randomization, the risk behaviors could be different. The, the, the nature of our capture of outcomes could be different. Lots of things could be different that are confounding my analysis. We could look like Moravarak is beating placebo when it's actually the same, but we happen to choose low-risk people that we gave Moravarak to, and these were high-risk behavior people that we were giving placebo to. So it, that's called confounding. That's called prognostic factors that are imbalanced. So risk behavior is a prognostic factor. I need randomization. So you're saying, Fleming, I get it. If I did a superiority trial against placebo in a non-randomized way, I'm going to do an adjustment. I'm going to make you win huge. And that's what we do in clinical research. I always say, good clinical trial science is the best friend of an intervention because it empowers you to see small differences. I remember Dave Amon, a clinical colleague, one of my mentors at Mayo Clinic in Oncology 40 years ago said, ah, Fleming, you worry about randomization. Look, the next penicillin that shows up, we won't need randomization. We will be able to see it's superior. I said, you're right, Dave, you're right. The next time we have another penicillin breakthrough where we reduce mortality from 60% to 20%, I don't need randomization. But I predicted 40 years ago, not because I was so wise, 
that most of our advances that we have that are clinically important are moderate in size. They're not enormous in size. Name how many penicillins we have. Name how many therapies reduce mortality from 65% to 20%. I don't need all five fingers. So the advantage of good quality research is the ability to discern no effect from moderate yet clinically relevant effects. And you can't do that without randomization. You're going to take a hit. You're going to discount it. Well, I'm arguing in non-inferiority, we also have to take a discount. You say, wait a minute, Fleming, wait a minute. We use randomization. You know that IPREX trial, it was randomized when I was comparing the active comparator against placebo. And you know what? My Moravarok trial is randomized. So what are you worried about? I've controlled for those covariates that are prognostic. Yes, you have. But you've not controlled for covariates that are effect modifiers. So while it's true that I don't have an imbalance in the fraction of people who are treated who are high risk, low risk from untreated who are high risk, low risk, my active comparator trial could be done in a setting where the effect of treatment is much bigger than in my non-inferiority trial. That's where the covariates are effect modifiers. So if, in fact, my level of adherence affects, and it does, the level of adherence to Trivada hugely affects how effective it is. So if I had in IPREX or in the, in the female setting, in, in partner's prep, if I had highly adherent people, and now in my Moravarok trial I have low adherent people, that's a huge effect modifier for the effect of the active comparator. So here, it's covariates that are effect modifiers that worry me, not, a, not covariates that are prognostic. But that's still of huge importance. That means that I cannot assume the constancy assumption holds. So therefore, for this reason, I have to not take the point estimate, but some kind of adjustment. Well, why do I have to take half the effect? That's the second thing. Why do I have to, in fact, preserve an appropriate fraction? Let me motivate this. So some research that I did with John Powers was antibiotics. So we went back and actually documented what everybody says. We documented it. What's the effect of antibiotics in penicillin with Alex Fleming? wasn't my grandfather. Alexander Fleming, who developed penicillin. How do, how do we know what the effect of antibiotics was in pneumonia in those settings. So what we did was an extensive and comprehensive review of the literature from the 1940s and 50s and 60s for the development of antibiotics, specifically with uh, uh, sulfonamide derivatives and penicillin in community-acquired bacterial pneumonia. And the endpoint was mortality. And we looked at all classes of patients. But it, it's noteworthy that in, even in non-bacteremic patients, if they're elderly, I hate to call that elderly now, if they are uh, approaching middle age, if they're above 50, um, then you get a threefold reduction in mortality. It's marvelous. In bacteremic patients, it's even better. It's like a 65% mortality down to 20%. It's beautiful. Antibiotics work huge in community acquired pneumonia, hospital acquired pneumonia, ventilator associated pneumonia. They have a huge effect on mortality. Okay, now, in that context, where we know antibiotics have a huge effect on mortality. Suppose you come along with a new experimental intervention. Antipyretics, you want to reduce the fever, and something else you give. And you know what? You do a randomized trial against no specific treatment, no specific treatment, and you find a statistically significant relatively 25% reduction from 49% to 37%. So a one quarter reduction in mortality. Statistically significant, but clinically modest in a cohort of people that could have taken antibiotics. OK. Question. You now have a parent or a sibling or someone else that you love and care for, and they have pneumonia. This is now a proven effective intervention. This is a patient that could take antibiotics and would benefit from them. Are you going to use, an exper are you going to use this experimental therapy? How many would give your family member that experimental therapy because it reduces their mortality from 49 to 37? How many would? How many wouldn't? Where are the rest of you? I guess. People are like, you mean you wouldn't give them anything or you wouldn't give them? So, you tell me. Those of you who wouldn't give this, 
There were some of you. Raise your hands. I hope you're my family members, I actually said. <laughs> what would you give them? Antibiotics. Antibiotics. Yeah. Are you kidding me? Yeah. You got to choose. Are you guys worried? Are you 16% mortality, 37% mortality. They're after your money, Tom. I, I, I've narrowed my range of people that I want to be <laughs> signing <laughs> over my medical power of opinion here for me. You're debating whether to give me something that has 16% mortality or 37. Clue, I'd like the 16%. <laughs> okay? And this is a policy statement, government policy statement. It's not good enough to beat placebo when you have interventions that have major benefits, not on symptoms, on irreversible morbidity and mortality. Wonderfully stated by President Clinton and Vice President Gore in a 1995 policy statement. This policy statement says, it is essential for public health protection that a new therapy be as effective as alternatives that are already approved for marketing when, okay, it's okay if it's symptoms. Yes, you can use something else. But you cannot use something that's effective but discernibly less effective than something else when it's death, irreversible morbidity. When it's death, when it's stroke, when it's HIV infection, you, have, you must not, it is not adequate FDA to approve an agent that is effective when it is actually discernibly less effective than something else that's affecting irreversible morbidity and mortality or when it's in a contagious disease. By the way, HIV meets both of these. So it's, it is policy statement, at least if you weren't already worried about giving me the antibiotics as an elderly friend because of the 16 plus 37, it's a policy statement that you are not author. This is not adequate evidence of benefit, even though it's statistical superiority to a placebo when you have something else. Consequence, therefore, is preservation of effect is by policy a critical issue. It's not good enough to rule out placebo when you have an intervention like Truvada. Look, how hard do we work? How, you guys know, we've been at this for decades. It's really hard to prevent transmission of HIV. It's really hard. When we succeed, are we willing to give it back? And non-inferiority with big margins readily can be giving back that progress. That makes no sense. You've got to preserve what you've achieved and move forward from that. And actually, if you don't believe me, it's a policy statement that we have to do that. And FDA follows those policy statements. So the margin here, it's critical that it be set rigorously to preserve the active comparator effect and to adjust for the uncertainty that comes to the assumption. So in an article that we recently published, several of us published, including some uh, authors from FDA, our argument was if it's, it's, you're going to find in, it, in clinical research, it's going to be hugely tempting to choose big margins. It's, it's, there's just such a temptation to say, let's rule out it's 25% higher. Ruling out it's 10% higher is going to be a trial that's threefold larger. Fleming, we're going to need 11,000 people. We could do this trial with 3,500. 3,500 is a lot. Come on, let's do a 3,500 with a 25% margin. Yeah, that's, it's going to be, and, and you're much more likely to be positive. Those are realities. If, however, a 10 or a 15 or a 20% increase matters, then it's bogus to say ruling out a 25% increase is not a priority. And here's the classic example that I've seen. I can't tell you how often I've seen this. People do a non-inferiority trial to rule out their 25% worse. And, and I'll draw the picture here. They do a non-inferiority trial to rule out their 25% worse. And they're going to get this if their point estimate is right here, ruling out 25% worse. But their point estimate is actually over here showing their 12% better, ruling out a quality. And they are just euphoric. They're so excited. We're gonna, we're, we can actually claim Moravarak is superior to Truvada. It's superior. We can market it as a superior agent. It's not just non-inferior and similar, it's superior. I said, well, wait, 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 wait a minute. Aren't you the people that designed the NI trial to have a 25% margin, meaning that it's clinically irrelevant to have an effect less than that? And your point estimates, you're 11% better ruling out you're the same? 
That's statistically persuasive evidence of a clinically irrelevant effect. And this happens in non-inferiority trials, where you get a really nice result over here, but because the people chose an absurdly high NI margin, I throw it right back at them. You told me by this NI margin that anything less than 25% is not clinically relevant. Now you show you're 14% better. That's not 25% better, therefore it's not clinically relevant. Well, wait a minute. They're not happy about that. I can't tell you how often I've talked to people in lung cancer survival trials where they'll have a thousand events and they'll prove that they are in fact four days better in survival. So their survival is seven months plus four days and the control arm is seven months. But with a thousand events, that's plus and minus three days. So that rules out equality. And so they say, we are statistically significantly superior in survival. I say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Your lower limit is one day, but your upper limit is seven. If I have seven months to live, what's a week? It's irrelevant. You've proven that you have statistically persuasive evidence of a clinically irrelevant effect. And so it cuts both ways here. This, this amount here absolutely needs to be justified as small enough that anything less than that doesn't matter. I have trouble 25% on HIV infection, arguing that 20% doesn't matter. Come on. Give me a break. Yes? There's one way around this to the initial non-inferiority trial with a large margin like that. So you can keep the sample sizes small, and then if you meet that, no, okay, never mind. I was going to say, to do a second, like we no, have a confirmatory because trial. Because the problem like is, yeah. if you do a trial that's one quarter the size to rule this out, and in the end, you get an estimate that's here that rules this out, it doesn't rule this out. So the only way you're going to come out is if you're lucky and your estimate is over here and it rules this out as well. So yes, you could get by with a trial that's too small, but now you have to be better to rule out you're a little bit worse. No, what I meant was would you then go do a second trial? Yes, I could. Make it much bigger. And yes, I could. Instead of spending all the money doing 11,000. Yes, I could. So if you're, if you're, that's a totally valid strategy. I call that a screening trial. Mm -hmm which is basically not definitive unless I have a really big effect, unless I get a really positive result. Yes, that's valid. That's called a screening trial. But be careful to be assured to, to, that you don't call it positive by ruling that out. You're really only calling it positive when you rule that out. And, and as we started four and a half hours ago, people want to call things positive. And it's important to be clear what it is. So, so fundamentally, it's we work hard to achieve the advances we have. We have made advances that are important. Antiretrovirals are marvelous for treatment. And in fact, we've now learned from 052 marvelous as a prevention strategy. But we need more. We need to protect people who are uninfected when they can't be sure that the partners they have are taking treatment for infection. So we need PrEP. Well, we have some advances in some settings. Trivada works in some, some places it doesn't. In some cases it does. Where it does, it's still of interest to replace it, but we've got to make sure that we're using NI margins that we can defend are truly reliably allowing us to determine when it's similar. That we cannot get, and it's, it's very easy to get roped into the concept of choosing a big margin to make the trial a lot smaller and affordable so we can get it funded. Uh, questions, other questions? Yes. So we're talking about uh, ways to decrease the sample size, right? Where yes. We want, we, want fewer, we want to have fewer people in these studies. Yes. Uh, so another way that often people choose is to pick a particular population that's particularly high risk yes. for those studies. Yes, indeed. Uh, and so how does this necessarily relate to uh, taking a high risk population and then extrapolating that to the population? It's a great that's question. Right? It's a great question. This trial that was success in the way I, in the way I laid it out involves 6,400 people. But the 6,400 number is really only indirectly relevant. This is the entirely relevant number. On this relative risk scale that we're using, the power of the trial is entirely dependent on numbers of events. So if you were actually able to look at a population that didn't have a 2% rate, but a 5% rate, you would get the same number of events with only 1,600 per arm. If you could find a group of people that you follow at a 5% rate for enough years, 
two years, then you could cut this from 1,600 per arm to 800 per arm. Absolutely. So by following people longer or having high risk groups, you can get the valid conclusion in smaller numbers. The problem with that, though, is what you said about extrapolating. What is the clinical setting of interest here? Are these higher risk people, people where the effect of Travada that we know from, from the active comparator trial, the IPREX trial in MSM, or the partner's prep trial in, in heterosexual couples, does that result apply to a really high risk setting? Because we have to assume the constant assumption holds. Uh, and and you know, maybe it's the reverse. Maybe it is particularly effective. Maybe Travada, the action compared, is particularly effective in a real high risk setting where people are really motivated to be careful and not so effective in low risk settings, in which case can we generalize the result. So generalizing the result matters, but that's gonna, you're gonna have that challenge either way. So my general approach is to do what you're saying, is to follow people longer and to achieve a higher level of risk in order to make the trial more feasible in, in, in size. Because the numbers of events drives the trial, not the sample size. Well, oh, one yes. question is kind of related to prevention. So do we, I see since I have kept up with the literature, do we know whether there's any resistance for the infants who are treated with nevirapine, mother-to-child transmission, later when they get infected, you know, as young adults and uh, adults? Are they able to be treated with uh, Travada? Are there any concerns? So if they have received, so, so is the, in fact, is the efficacy of a Travada regimen dependent on the nature of what earlier antiretrovirals the people are exposed to? It's, it's a great question. So my, my stance on this is, it's not my responsibility to prove that it could depend on that. It's your responsibility to prove that it doesn't if you want to generalize your results to settings that are beyond what was studied in the historical superiority trial for the active comparator. Now, the problem with all of that reasoning that I just gave is one of the downsides, one of the many downsides to non-inferiority is it, it mires us in the past. So let's suppose that as we've gone forward, whether it's an antibiotic that we're using for pneumonia or skin infections, or whether it's a microbicide that we're using for HIV transmission, we will presumably learn more as we go forward about issues that could be effect modifiers, what is the right dose, what's the right schedule of Travada, um, the kinds of people that we should target, uh, the, the way we should assess treatment effect in terms of duration of the trial and all that. The problem is all of those things are changing fundamental parameters from the original Travada placebo-controlled trial that could be parameters that affect constancy assumption. And so the terrible thing about non-inferiority is you're making advances. So in antibiotics, maybe you decide you do want to give an oral antibiotic as soon as a person shows up to the emergency room with a pneumonia diagnosis and not wait those 24 hours. Well, the problem is now I cannot assess the effect of, of the, uh, uh, the standard of care antibiotic that I'm using as the control arm because the historical control didn't have that antibiotic being given up front. And that clearly is going to affect what the effect is of my active comparator. So we're forcing people into an antiquated way of providing supportive care, for selecting patients, for defining how to maximize the regimen of Travada, and for the nature of the endpoint that we use, so the constant assumption holds. So what do we do? Anytime you can possibly do it, do superiority. In almost all cases, although I've given a counterexample, in almost all cases, we're doing better for healthcare by improving what we're doing, not by showing we're similar to what we're doing. Now, I think Travada and Mararak provides a good counterexample to that. But I love on, I, the things I don't like about oncology for sure. But one thing I like is they almost never do non inferiority. I hate anti infectives. Everything they do is non-inferiority, and it's really a pity because we haven't had randomization for 100 years. 
randomization was, was created in 1924. And the leaders in clinical research to implement randomization were people who were doing anti-infective trials in the 30s and 40s and 50s. They were at the, they were at the, at the forefront of evidence-based medicine. They've fallen to the, to the back now. Everything they do is non-inferiority. Whereas in, in oncology, while well, they have problems, at least they do superiority. We've done superiority, but by virtue of our successes now, there are definitely settings where non-inferiority is on our radar. And I, and I get it. If, if, if you really are targeting a population, although I'd say the part population you really want to target are the, tr are the people who don't benefit from Truvada. But if you really want to target a population that has 75% reduction with Truvada because of high levels of adherence that can already be achieved, such as in discordant partners, then I get it. You've got to do non-inferiority unless you think Moravrox is actually better. And to my way of thinking, one way of kind of bridging this is to say, we're going to look for an alternative to Dravada that isn't enough better to be superior, but it's enough better to be numerically better that I can rule out your worst without a huge sample size. And that's what happened in, that ex in the example I gave in the end, was that the Moravarok data that I gave, 133 events against 153, gave a point estimate of 0.87. Didn't rule out one, but it ruled out 1.1. And we succeeded in that because we're a little better. Tom, I hate to do this, but I yeah. think we better let people go. Yeah. So, so we, you were serious we couldn't go to five. Yeah, I'm sorry. Well, I mean, you can keep going, but as I said, we may have. Well, I, but I said, if you all leave, I will stop. Well, the camera's always on in this 24th century. All right, world. great. Thanks. Thanks, uh, all. I think a round of applause for all.